Good morning, everybody. We have a slight change in the agenda. So listen, because we don't have any uh, visual explanation of this. Uh, the next two hours, we'll have two talks. We'll start off with the last review talk right now. 20 minutes, Cal Armour will talk about projections and how pattern effect is linked to ECS. Uh, we will uh, follow this by 10 minute Q&A, like the review talks in the beginning. <clears throat> and then Cal and I will attempt to summarize the breakouts, also 20 minutes. And then we will move into the very final, very best uh, uh, last hour discussion. And then at short before 10, we break for a break, for coffee break. Um, and after this uh, optional, if you'd like to stay and hang around and learn about uh, Greens Function Map. So we also have a request that if you have a poster hanging up to take it down by the 10 a.m. break or during the 10 a.m. break, um, we need to rearrange the poster boards for next week. So um, please do that at that time. If it's still up, we will recycle them. And then we also have a quick announcement from two grad students if they want to come up here. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Mark, I am Maria's grad student, and this is Rachel, who is Christy's grad student, and we would just like to call them up really quickly. So we have watched them work really hard since like January, juggling also kids and classes and also mentoring us, and we just want to appreciate their hard work. So. I'm sure all of you learned something. We definitely did it during this week. Um, so we're just really proud to be their grad students. And we want to show our appreciation. So thank you. I don't get flowers because my cats are allergic to flowers and they like to eat them and then go to the ER. Hey, hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so I'm Kyle Armour at the University of Washington. I've been asked to talk about the topic of the pattern effect with implications for climate sensitivity and uh, transient warming. Um, too many people, than I, uh, more, more people than I can list have kind of contributed to my thinking here. I'll try to point out our results from various folks, but uh, this is gonna be kind of an overview talk of my current thinking on how a pattern effect influences these two things. And this is, uh, I'm very excited to have been here for the first annual uh, Clivar workshop on this topic. Um, so first I'll talk about uh, pattern effect in ECS. Um, so I want to just give a quick historical overview of like what was life like before the pattern effect, so the before times. So this is a paper in 2013 or 2014 quantifying climate sensitivity. It's a very simple idea. If you have observations of Earth's energy imbalance over the historical record, global warming over the historical record, radiative forcing, you can just do a simple linearization of the global mean energy budget, the equation on the right. You can calculate lambda, which is the net radiative feedback. Then assuming lambda stays constant to equilibrium, you can just calculate the equilibrium climate sensitivity. Just the CO2 doubling forcing divided by lambda gives you ECS. So when you do this, I, I don't know. <laughs> None of these buttons work anymore. There we go. Um, so when you do this, uh, this is what Otto et al. got, is essentially two degrees for ECS with a fairly small range from about 1.5 up to about four. So tightly constrained. Um, so if you read the AP, IPCC AR5 report, uh, this was the main reason that the lower bound started at 1.5 degrees, was essentially this historical constraint on, on uh, climate sensitivity. But if you look at the summary for policymakers, they have this statement um, as a footnote, which is that no best estimate of climate sensitivity can be given because of disagreements across various lines of evidence in the report. And the basic idea here is that other lines of evidence, like paleoclimate models, suggest a climate sensitivity at the time of about three degrees, whereas this line of evidence suggested a climate sensitivity of about two degrees. So this was a big discrepancy across those lines of evidence. Uh, next slide, I guess my buttons don't work. <laughs> um, maybe next slide as well. They sometimes work, I don't know. Um, the other big discrepancy is between this line of evidence and GCM. So this is just showing CMIP5 and CMIP6 ranges of climate sensitivity. So a big offset between our perceived climate sensitivity from the historical record, and what GCMs suggest. Um, fast forward to present day. So this is uh, figures from IPCC AR6. And the figure on the left, you can see the evolution of climate sensitivity 
over time in these various reports. And you can really see the AR5 range was quite wide, particularly at the low end, it extended down to 1.5, no best estimate, to AR6, where the best estimate was three degrees with a much more narrow range of climate sensitivity, particularly on the low end. It came up from about 1.5 to about two for the likely range. And the major advance in, on, in terms of that, uh, that change in range came from various sources. Number one, it came from combining different lines of evidence. So the Shorewood paper was pretty influential in our thinking there. Um, so we assessed way more than just models and paleoclimate and modern observations. We also looked at process understanding of cloud feedbacks. We looked at uh, paleoclimate states in a more rigorous way. Um, emergent constraints played a big role here. All those things combined to narrow the range of climate sensitivity. But the big change compared to AR5, I would argue, is the instrumental record. Instead of being the tightest constraint on climate sensitivity, now it's no constraint on climate sensitivity. It has a lower bound of about two, but unconstrained upper bound. And the reason for that is the pattern effect. So just to um, illustrate this again, on the left here is the observed pattern of warming over the historical record. On the right is what we think the future pattern will be under four times CO2, according to GCMs. Those patterns are different. And I don't know what's going on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, they're different, and because they project onto patterns of radiation, so this is just uh, Green's function from UA Dong, um, you expect, what's that? Do I need to press something? So we're going to have to slide usually, but if somebody comes in on WebEx, WebEx takes over, so if they click on the slides to get control back. Awesome, I'll try that. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, so combining these two things, right, the pattern of warming changes, the pattern of warming projects on the radiative feedbacks in different regions. In particular, we've had delayed warming over the historical record in the East Pacific and the Southern Ocean. Those are regions of more positive feedback on average. We've had a, a, enhanced warming in the Indo-Pacific warm pool. That's a negative feedback. So when you take that, that change in the pattern into account, you can do this with AGCMs. If you run these two different patterns under the same atmosphere models, uh, what you find is that the feedbacks for the historical record are more negative than the feedbacks for future warming. So that's a pattern effect uh, that you have to account for in the climate sensitivity estimate. And so really what we were observing in the historical record is not the ECS. We were observing the effect of climate sensitivity, which then uh, increases over time as that pattern evolves. And so instead of having lambda as your equilibrium feedback, you need to think about lambda plus some delta lambda, where delta lambda we often refer to as the pattern effect we're trying to quantify. And for the historical record, we think that's about 0.5 watts per meter squared per Kelvin, which is a huge effect. It really moves up the climate sensitivity over the historical record and blows up the upper bound completely. Um, so this is why uh, the blue here is auto and the orange is kind of my estimate ac accounting for that pattern effect where basically there is no longer any upper bound. So that's essentially what happened in AR6. So what that means is that the strong constraints on climate sensitivity, uh, climate sensitivity, particularly at the high end, are coming from other lines of evidence, paleoclimate and emerging constraints and cloud physics primarily. So some outstanding questions about the pattern effect. Uh, we talked about a lot of these, but I'll just reiterate the ones I think are really important here. Um, this is all dependent on using GCMs, AGCMs, given historical warming patterns to calculate this. Number one, we have no observational constraint on the pattern effect directly yet. We are also incredibly dependent on the observed or reconstructed SST patterns, which we know are quite spotty going back further in time. So can we produce better reconstructions of SSTs, particularly before 1900, which is our base period for these climate sensitivity calculations? Um, we need to know why climate models fail to reproduce a lot of the observed patterns of warming. We need to understand how, we need to quantify how confident we are in models ready to response to those patterns because we're using the models to quantify the pattern effect. And then finally, can we place observational constraints? And I'd, I'd say the fundamental issue here is the fact that we've had delayed warming or even cooling in the regions of most positive feedbacks. So the places that give us high ECS in models are the regions we have yet to observe warming in. So the fundamental question is, can we say something about what those feedbacks will do once those regions warm? That's the only way we'll be able to really constrain whether we have high uh, ECS or not in the future. So that's the fundamental problem I see. Um, other things about the pattern effect that are kind of interesting is, can we use the paleoclimate record to say something about ECS? And if so, uh, how do we account for the pattern effect given that the proxy record is often very spotty? We need ways to reconstruct SSTs globally and see us to say something about what feedbacks look like. Um, also, can we use those paleoclimate states to say something about long-term future warming? Are they good analogs? So just an example from the Pliocene, on the left is the pattern of warming in the models under four times CO2, just to, due to CO2 forcing. On the right are two, two example reconstructions of the Pliocene pattern of warming. One is directly from proxies and some kind of infilling. The other one is from Natalie Burles, where she combines proxies and GCMs to kind of do a dynamical infilling. And so the patterns look quite different. In particular, things like the Eastern Tropical Pacific have a warm uh, 
a, a, a lot of warming in the cold tongue in Natalie's reconstruction. That's coming from the dynamical constraints within the GCM. Um, but both of these patterns on the right, they give you feedbacks if you put them under atmospheric GCMs that are near zero. So a lambda close to zero or even positive. So that pattern in the Pliocene apparently is a runaway feedback if you take that pattern seriously. So there's a few different possible interpretations. Uh, number one is possibly the Pliocene pattern is our future. That implies that the future is going to have incredibly high ECS if that pattern emerges. Incredibly polar amplified, a lot of warming in the East Pacific and no warming in the West Pacific. If that's our future, ECS will be incredibly high. Another possible interpretation is maybe the four times CO2 pattern in the models is a better representation of the future. And the Pliocene, then you have a huge pattern effect between the Pliocene and the future that need to, needs to be taken into account. The Pliocene wasn't that warm, and yet the feedbacks were probably very positive for that pattern. That implies the cloud physics has a very small feedback. So that implies a very low climate sensitivity from the Pliocene, if you think about it that way. Another possible interpretation is just that Pliocene pattern is not right, that we need better reconstructions of the Pliocene, and maybe those will tell us about the future. I have no idea which of these three interpretations is correct right now, but all of them involve the pattern effect, and they need to be taken into account. Without knowing the SSC pattern, you can't use that period directly to constrain climate sensitivity because you need to account for these big feedback changes. Um, I want to move on now to thinking about the pattern effect in transient warming. I think it's usually been framed as just a way to correct climate sensitivity, but I want to show you five or six examples of why I think it's also important for transient warming in the recent past and transient warming in the future. So climate sensitivity, that is equilibrium climate sensitivity, is often framed as the only thing you need to understand transient warming in the next, say, 100 years. So this is a very nice figure from Sherwood et al. I think Maria might have made this. I don't know. Various folks have made figures like this where there's a linearity between ECS and warming over the next uh, century. But is that the whole story? Maybe it's not. So this is some really nice work um, out of, uh, uh, from uh, Dave Schneider, um, Cecile Hene, and, and Jen Kay. Uh, also, I think this is inspired by work by uh, Fry and, and Kay from a little while ago, where basically here's three different versions of CSM. Uh, CSM1, CSM1 star, and, C and CSM2. These are all slightly different cloud physics between CSM1 and 1 star, where Jen and group have changed the Southern Ocean clouds and it's increased ECS from four degrees to 5.6. So ECS increased, yet the transient warming over the 21st century showed no change. And then CSM2 has also a higher climate sensitivity, but also the same amount of transient warming over the 21st century. So here's just an example where ECS is not the thing that's critical for future warming. I don't know for sure, but I think it's because all these models have the same effective climate sensitivity in the future because the, the Southern Ocean hasn't warmed, which are the places where the feedbacks are most different between these versions. Another just a quick example is if you just look at 1% per year ramping simulations of CMIP-5. I did this calculation like, I don't know, six or seven years ago, so I don't vouch for all the details. But the basic idea is that there is a correlation between ECS and transient warming. That correlation becomes much better if you correlate the warming with effective climate sensitivity. That is, the actual feedbacks operating under 1% per year, it becomes a much better uh, correlation. So ECS is not the full story. Other examples, uh, this comes from the work of Yue Dong um, in collaboration with uh, Shaina Sadai who's a graduate student uh, at UMass Amherst, I believe, where uh, China added a bunch of fresh water to an RCP 8.5 simulation for the future. And what this is showing is the difference between just the standard RCP 8.5 simulation with CSM1 versus the version where you've added meltwater from Antarctica, where they've tried to constrain the meltwater input based on what they think the Antarctic ice sheet might do in the future. And the point is you get a lot of Southern Ocean cooling. You also get teleconnections into the tropics. In particular, you cool the East Pacific. Um, if you wanted to hear about the dynamics of that, talk to Sarah King, talk to Yue Dong and others who really thought about how you get that teleconnection into the tropics. But the point is you basically cool all those regions of positive feedbacks uh, preferentially. And when you do that, you slow down the warming rate by something like a degree at the end of the century. And the this is not new in terms of adding fresh water. What's really new in terms of this interpretation is that UA has calculated very carefully the effective feedbacks over time in this simulation. Also things like ocean heat uptake efficiency and demonstrated that the main reason for slower warming is actually the pattern effect. It's, the, it's the, the more negative feedbacks that are activated by this freshwater input cooling, preferentially in positive feedback regions. So that's the region, reason in this model anyway, that you get less warming in the future when you add meltwater. I'm just mashing all the keys, hoping some of them go forward. Okay, good. Um, so another example is the recent 
past. So there's a bunch of papers now that correlate ECS with recent warming over the last uh, 20 or, or the last 40 years. So it's just an example of, but where I put all the CMIP5 and CMIP6 models together. There's a strong correlation between ECS and transient warming. But a fundamental question is why is ECS correlated with transient warming? Why isn't it some effective climate sensitivity that matters for the recent 40 year period? And to answer that, what I did is I started to look at a subset of models where you can actually quantify the effective climate sensitivity. And you can do that by running RF MIP simulations where you basically fix SSTs and time vary the forcings. Once you have the forcing, you can subtract that out and calculate the feedbacks. And so that's what I'm gonna show you here is the subset of models that allow that calculation. So those subset of models have that strong correlation between ECS and transient warming. The fundamental reason is they also have a, a strong correlation between their effective climate sensitivity and transient warming. And the reason is basically because their effective climate sensitivity is equal to their ECS to a, a large degree. And the reason is basically because these models their forced response looks like four times CO2 largely. There are subtle differences. The Southern Ocean is more delayed over the recent period. That's why their effective sensitivity is a little bit lower than their ECS off that one to one line in that right figure. But they're basically the same pattern in their forced response in the transient versus their equilibrium. But you can also, um, in this subset, um, you can look at these. These are all large ensembles. So you can actually look across ensemble members and ask, why is there a range of warming across ensemble members and where might Earth be in this kind of uh, internal variability way of thinking about this? So they have a large spread in their warming rate over the last 40 years, sometimes doubling the warming rate depending on which ensemble member you choose. That warming rate is largely correlated across ensemble members with the effective climate sensitivity in those ensemble members. And so even though their force response effective sensitivity is the same as the ECS, there's a variability in the effective sensitivity that controls the warming rate. And so it's different in different models, but something like 50% to 70% of the variance is explained by effective sensitivity in terms of the warming rate across ensemble members. You can further ask, where does nature lie on this? And so if you take the same, same models, but run their atmospheric GCMs with the observed pattern of warming, you get these diamonds. And so the right figure here, as I toggle back and forth, is showing their effective sensitivity when you give them the observed warming rate, and they're all about two degrees, plus or minus a little bit. Even models with an ECS of something like six end up with an effective sensitivity of about two when you put in the observed pattern of warming. And so what this implies is that the models might be overestimating recent warming, not because their ECS is too high, but just because they got the wrong pattern of warming, which raises the question of why the models have biases in the patterns of warming. If you try to correct for that, uh, you would guess the models would do just fine over the historical, historical record if only they had something that could force that pattern of warming to occur. So, for example, freshwater input from Antarctica, this is, I think, one leading hypothesis, again, worked by Yue Dong and Andrew Pauling here, where they've added freshwater melt from Antarctica uh, over the historical record. What you do is you produce a more La Nina-like pattern, Southern Ocean cooling, you reduce the feedbacks, more negative feedbacks, and you slow the warming rate, bringing the model more in line with observations. This is important because this is something that none of the GCMs captured. They don't have freshwater melt from Antarctica. This is a potential explanation for why high ECS models tend to overestimate the warming. They may just be missing Antarctic meltwater, for instance. It's possible. Um, and another quick example is possibly ozone depletion. So again, work by UA, in this case with Lorenzo Polvani, where she's looked at runs with or without ozone depletion. And the impact of the ozone hole gives you a La Nina-like pattern uh, in response. And talk to her about the dynamics behind this. I know others are also thinking about this. It's a very hot topic right now. But this is another potential explanation that projects onto the pattern effect. Um, okay, so just some outstanding questions here. Uh, the big one is how the pattern is going to change in the future. To answer that, we really need to know what's happened in the past. And I've just listed here a bunch of possible explanations. It could be internal variability over the last 40 years. The role of non-CO2 forcings are very important, ozone or freshwater, uh, aerosols. All of these things are not going to persist into the distant future, so the pattern is expected to change. However, the timescale over which all these different things relax back to some four, four times CO2 or, or long-term CO2 force pattern are all very different. And so what has driven the past is critical for making uh, predictions for the future. And so I wanna end just on uh, kind of some a thought experiment of how important might the pattern effect be for transient warming in the future. So what I've done is just taken the held two layer model and I've run it, I've tuned it to all the CMIP5 and CMIP6 four times CO2 response functions. So basically tune all the model parameters to match uh, the couple GCMs, and then I've just run it over the historical record, and I'm going to show you projections for the future under a couple different assumptions. So the first thing is, if I take that uh, that tuned two layer model, it reproduces the historical record fairly well up until about 1980, where some of the high ECS models overestimate warming. But if I if I then go into that model 
and basically by hand change lambda to give you an effective climate sensitivity of two degrees, which is what the AGCM suggests occurred in the last 40 years, all of those ensemble members agree pretty well with the observations, which is exactly what we expect, because if you just force the feedbacks to be two degrees, uh, an effective sensitivity of two, the high ECS model is now warm right in line with the observations. So not that interesting. However, if you then project into the future without, uh, without fiddling with the feedbacks, you get this huge spread in future warming coming from the very high to very low climate sensitivity models. But now we can start thinking about thought experiments of what if the pattern effect persists? So what if that effective sensitivity of two persists all the way to 2100? And the answer is you end up at the very low end of the IPCC projected range, which makes sense because kind of two to two to five was the bounds that IPCC gave for climate sensitivity. So this is kind of an example of what would happen if the observed pattern of cooling continued all the way to 2100. We keep seeing cooling in the Southern Ocean and, and East Pacific. So maybe the meltwater increases. This would be the kind of example that could do this. Um, what happens if instead you relax back to just the natural for, uh, the coupled model climate sensitivity, each coupled model, basically I, all I did here is let lambda linearly relax back to its natural state over the next 40 years. So basically this is the example of what if it's all variability that just reverses in the next 40 years and you basically end up with the same spread by 2100 you would have anyway. And you can do the same thing if it relaxes back by 2100, same thing. And so the point is transiently the pattern effect very much matters. If the pattern stays the same, we expect a lot less warming. If the pattern reverses to something like what the models predict it should, we expose ourselves to very high climate sensitivity, potentially the full range at that point. Um, I'm not the only one thinking about this. So just an example from Mark Alessi, check out his poster. They've done this in a slightly different way. They've thought about how patterns change and they use Green's functions to project how that would impact the feedbacks and then make projections for warming. Um, and others, I think Piers mentioned, um, some work as well uh, in his group uh, working on this as well. So a lot of people are thinking about how the changes in the future might impact transient warming. But the point is it matters. It's not just a problem for ECS. It's actually a problem for the evolution of temperatures over the next, say, 20 to 100 years. OK, all in there. I just want to say thank you very much. I didn't bring flowers, so sorry. But thank you very much to Maria and Christy. Um, I'm on the organizing committee, but I did not do any organizing. It was essentially all of them. And so I want to thank them very much for all their all their efforts. I really uh, learned a lot of this meeting and I really had a great time. And I hope you all did as well. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can. OK. Um, I hope you don't mind if I start out the morning with a little sarcasm after your very sweet thank you to Maria and Christy, which I second. Um, you know, I came to the meeting to think about what this means for precipitation, and I think your talk really convinced me that climate sensitivity is actually still interesting, too. Oh, hmm? thanks. Um, okay, next, next, next that's, question. That's the sarcasm. Oh. But the serious question is, um, one of the things that you were touching on is that accounting for the pattern effect, you can uh, really increase the bound on what ECS could possibly be. And one of the discussions that I've heard going on, not necessarily in this group of people, but in a like kind of larger group of people, is whether or not we should rule out the high climate sensitivity models, which is pretty conse consequential, right, um, for society and what we're doing about global warming. And so I wanted to, I think you touched on it a little, but I wanted to get your take explicitly on that. Should, do you think we should rule those out? Do you think we need to take them more seriously because of the pattern effect? Where do you stand on that? Yeah, thanks. I, I can answer that in two ways. The, the first is the one big reason that we've kind of ruled out high sensitivity models is their, their too high warming rate over the recent few decades. But I think a large reason for that was just that they don't capture the right pattern of warming. So I kind of showed some evidence for that. So I think that's not a strong line of evidence to rule out high ECS models, but we have other lines of evidence. So I'm pretty convinced by the paper showing that very high ECS models fail to replicate the LGM or Pliocene. That's another line of evidence that also says high ECS models are less likely um, uh, you also have cloud feedbacks that say ECS above six degrees is less likely. So there's other lines of evidence I think become more important, but I think the main one we used, which is the recent historical rate of warming, is not as strong as we think it, it is. And so I, I would give some caution in terms of over-interpreting that because of these pattern effects. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Thanks, Angie. Jonathan Gregory has his hand up. Okay, uh, I guess he took his hand down. I just got confused about one thing that uh, when we talk about transient warming, there are two things might change the, the warming rate. The one thing is the ocean heat uptake itself. It doesn't have to be anything related to the change of the feedback. The, the, let's say larger uh, ocean heat uptake could slow down the warming and change the transient warming. And in this process, it doesn't have to be the change of the uh, climate feedback. 
but there are also changes in the climate feedback. I just kind of uh, like those two things going on at the same time in the, this historical time period. I just want to hear uh, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. so the, the question, as I understand it, is kind of what's the role of ocean heat uptake and feedbacks? So they're both changing at the same time, so it's really hard to say the pattern effect influences transient warming because there might be compensations with ocean heat uptake. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think it's come up several times this meeting and everyone's kind of punted on the explanation because I don't think we fully understand. I can say I can say what I've done to try to get at that, which is within those large ensembles over the historical record, I've tried to calculate the effective feedback and I've also calculated the ocean heat uptake efficiency, which is basically per degree of warming, how much energy is going into the oceans globally. And there's very, there's very little correlation between transient warming and ocean heat uptake efficiency changes across ensemble members, but there's a very strong correlation with the effective feedback changes. So at least over shorter periods, like uh, 30 or 40 years, I think, or I, I should say on very short periods of, of years, I think changes in ocean heat redistribution dominate the variability. But as you start to get to say decades, to, to multiple decades, I think the effective feedbacks become more important. And then as you go to century time scales. I think the effective feedback is dominant, and I think differences across ensemble members or even across models in their ocean heat uptake efficiency becomes very, very small. And so the feedbacks and eventually ECS is the thing that controls long term warming. And so I think it, it depends on the time scale, but that, that's just I mean, a very cursory kind of look at the, at the models. So I don't I don't have a great theory for that, but it's a good question. Uh, you, you might have said this, but I, and, and I just missed it, but if the. Um... You know, if we take the current pattern as kind of a low range scenario for warming and the model produced pattern as the kind of standard, is there also kind of a high range possibility that we get a pattern that's even worse than what the models are suggesting in terms of how much warming we might get? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, in that little example I gave with the energy balance model, I didn't allow that. I just said, let the, let the current pattern revert back to the model projected pattern. But one example would be the Pliocene pattern. If we take those, those proxy, re, uh, uh, proxy reconstruction seriously, if that's our future, and if that materializes in the next 100 years, that would imply very, very high ECS given our knowledge of cloud physics, for instance. Um, another possibility is if if it's really just some kind of long, low frequency mode of variability in, in the IPO, for instance, and that reverses instead of cooling in the East Pacific and Southern Ocean, we expect we, we end up seeing extreme warming in those regions over the next 40 years. That would be another example where that might drive the warming rate to double compared to what it's been over the last 40 years if that switches. I haven't done that calculation carefully to, to give you a number necessarily, but that's a possibility, I think. Um, I don't know how likely it is. Yeah, I, th I think the point is the historical record doesn't rule out high ECS. That that has to come from other lines of evidence, like paleoclimate, our knowledge of cloud physics, other things. In my in my view. Yeah. So Peter's question there was, doesn't the Pliocene imply high ECS? And um, it, again, that comes back to those multiple interpretations I talked about. If that pattern is our future pattern, then yet high ECS is possible. However, I think more likely. Uh, in an interpretation is the Pliocene was not that warm, despite that crazy pattern that, that was projecting on the positive feedbacks, that would imply clouds are not that sensitive to warming. That would imply a very low ECS future. So it really depends on what, what interpretation you, you want. And I don't know the answer to that. Or low CO2 during the Pliocene. Or something else, yeah, right. So maybe we have the wrong forcings, right? So I think it's totally unconstrained once you start allowing for these pattern effects to start in fact impacting the feedbacks. I think the other possibility is those, those Pliocene reconstructions just aren't quite right, and we need we need better reconstructions that look more reasonable. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. This is really, really interesting. Um, I thought there was an interesting symmetry there between it seemed that the failure to properly account for the pattern effect led to the IPCC AR5 letting the range go down too low, maybe. And then in AR6, it's potentially the case that failure to properly account for the pattern effect on the observed warming rate has caused the certainty to become too narrow on the uh, ECS range by ruling out the very hot models, essentially, or the very high ECS uh, because they failed to match the historical record. Um, would you agree with that, that if failure to really properly account for pattern effect is part of the reason that the IPCC keeps widening and narrowing its, its ECS range? Or do you think that um, even if, if we didn't have that kind of instrumental record Tokarska type constraint, uh, ECS still would have been, you know, the high end of the ECS range still would have been ruled out by the other lines of evidence um, in, in AR6. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I, I think you have the, the right idea there that AR5 didn't account for it, which was too wide of a range, AR6 maybe overinterpreted that in my view. 
However, I, I will point you to Sherwood, which basically did not use those emergent constraints as a line of evidence and still arrived at a very similar ECS range. So I, I think there's, I think that ECS range of two to five is still fairly robust, even if you throw out these, these kind of emergent constraints from recent warming. Um, I think we can quibble about whether it should be, it should be five or six as an upper bound. So Sherwood gives some flexibility there, depending on your choice of prior. Um, there's some debate. I mean, we're talking then about tails of distributions, but in general, I think that two to five range is pretty robust, even if you toss out this line of evidence. In my view, maybe we should have written things a little bit differently to rely less on this or something like that. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't go thinking those high ECS models are back in play necessarily. I would just caution against using this line of evidence to throw them out. I think we need to look at paleo climate or other things to really evaluate them in different ways. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Along similar lines, Tim Andrew says, um, I'm really worried about the community pushing emergent constraints on recent decadal warming as a way of ruling out high sensitivity models. As an example, not to pick on one, the recent nature perspective piece by Housefather at all last week. These are high profile papers and largely premised on recent warming ruling out high sensitivity models. Yet everything we know about the pattern effect points in the direction that this may be the flawed assumption. What should we as a community do about this? How do we get the message out that it isn't as clear cut as all these high profile papers make it out? Yeah, great, great question from Tim. I, I don't I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, I guess I would I share his skepticism of emergent constraints because these kind of things are I mean, one, one way to think about emergent constraints is they work really well as long as there's not a shared common bias within all the models that you're using in the emergent constraint. And this is an example where there is where none of the models fully capture the observed pattern of warming and that Im directly impacts their warming rates so that kind of shifts the whole thing left or right and messes up the emergent constraint. And so I'm always nervous when I see emergent constraints used because you have to make sure there's nothing messing up the entire ensemble you're using in some way that biases that emergent constraint. In terms of the communication of this, I, I would say it's still true that the high ECS models are far less likely. I mean, it's written, we're getting into the you know arguments about whether there's a 5% or 10% chance of ECS above five, but it's still true that ECS most likely is three degrees plus or minus a little bit. And so I, I, I would still be comfortable saying those models should be downweighted in some way, but just how much we downweight them is really a, a quantitative detail, which I, I don't know the answer to. So I don't know, I'm not sure I answered Tim's question, but I would just caution against ruling them out entirely and using emergence constraints as the main evidence for it. We shouldn't do that. I think I've been waiting a long time. <laughs> Go at once and I'll. I'll I just want to, I want to follow up because it's a Pliocene related question. So just to, I think we really do need to revisit that result of the positive lambda for that Pliocene pattern. And the reason why I say that is because one, I think we, we talked about this earlier in the week, but one, I, I have, it comes from a coupled simulation which didn't have a runaway, right? And the forcing was, I think, very much positive because that's what caused the warming. Just to clarify, the forcing was changing cloud albedo gradients, right? But, um, I think in particular, I think it's because the greens function may not, it might be a limited tool because you can think about the Pliocene warm pool is now no longer constricted to the Eastern Equatorial Pacific and the Walker cell is much weaker. So I think we need, we need to do that in prescribed SST run. Just to clarify for those, I showed it very quickly. I didn't explain what I did, but those, those uh, simulations I showed were actually AGCM simulation, not greens functions. They okay. took your pattern and they ran. We also yeah. did the same thing for that, the prism pattern, which is different than yours, but it's also extremely polar amplified, which also gives you a runaway, uh, Feedback essentially. So there's a puzzle there, though. I'm st exactly. There's a puzzle because yeah. the, there's no runaway feedback in a couple the coupled simulation. So right. Yes, yeah, so I don't. I don't trust that result. It's just an example of like we really need to understand that better if we're going to use the Pliocene as a constraint. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Thanks. I had a very similar question about the the Pliocene, um, where you raised a few possibilities, including like there's there's errors in the data, which there there surely probably is. There we can't trust the greens functions, but. I was wondering if this could be interpreted, if you do trust the Green's function and the data as evidence that the, the Green's function is probably quite state dependent, because then this is showing there was a stable climate with this pattern, and that likely suggests that the current Green's function from the modern climate, where we have much more expensive sea ice, different walker circulation, um, would have very different feedbacks than, than the Pliocene would. Yeah, so again, for those simulations, they weren't greens functions, they were AGCMs run with those patterns, but we also tried to reconstruct those with greens functions and they do start to fail a little bit. So I think the greens functions work incredibly well over the historical record where you get a lot of warming where it's already warm and a lot of cooling where it's already cool. So convection kind of stays put. But as soon as you go to four times CO2 patterns, LGM patterns or Pliocene patterns, all of a sudden then you need AGCMs because if you try to use greens functions, you actually re re you get the wrong uh, reconstruction of radiation from those patterns. 
So that's another conundrum that we need to solve, which I think we're going to talk about later today when we talk about Green's function MIP. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks so much uh, for your talk. Um, you posed the question, how confident are we in models forced response? And I think that's so very key. And I'd like to hear your view. You've talked a lot about feedbacks and cloud feedbacks, ready to feedbacks, but not spent too much time on the ocean and possible deficiencies in, you know, ocean dynamics, as Chris talked about, and mixing and all of that. And is that something that we need to really improve in models to really uh, have more confidence in their force response. I just like your view on that. Yeah, it's a great question. I don't have strong views on this. I, I, I truly don't know how good. I think it's a very difficult thing to say whether the models have the right force response because, uh, well, for two, two reasons. I think it's very hard within models to even quantify forced and, and unforced unless you use large ensembles and you can start to do it or you use methods like Rob has developed, which are very nice to try to pull apart forced and unforced. So it's hard to say across all the models, right? We only have a sm small subset where we can start to do that. Um, but even then, I think there's, there's many, many ways in which you can nudge the models or get the models to look more like observations, right? Adding some fresh water um, could do it or choosing ensemble members that look more like observations. So it seems like a very hard question to say whether models have the right force response or not, because it comes down to these quantitative questions of how close does an ensemble member need to be to observations before you say that model is doing okay. And so I, I, I would turn that back to you because I think you're the expert on this and I, I don't have strong- Well, I'm not trying to get models to look like observations. I'm just wondering, Seems like you've emphasized this whole workshop a lot on, on you know, the atmosphere and cloud feedbacks and that they're co-located with regions of delayed warming, but how well do we know, you know, the oceanic influences uh, or how well are they represented? And is that something that the field has to really pay attention to? Yeah, I guess I guess I would just say this is, I think, a, a function of time scale. I would say the models look decent when you compare it to the long-term warming maybe not quite east-west gradients or something, but they, they get delayed warming in the Southern Ocean, they get enhanced Arctic warming, they get the basic features about, right? They start to fail when you start looking at the shorter, the recent decades where they don't get the walker circulation strengthening and they don't get cooling in these regions, right? So uh, my my null hypothesis is still variability is dominant, but I, I don't know for sure. Yeah, it, it, this, this is a great question though. I think the, the major challenge in climate dynamics right now, I'd say, yeah, thanks. Maybe just following up on that, I think, that's very critical, coming also back to what Chris talked about, processes like the EOC simulation in the ocean, or like mesoscale variability, I think are really essential. And I think we really need to consider high resolution models like to get better process based uh, for, for looking at these forced responses, uh, I feel. A lot of the models we are, we're using are, are missing some essential physics. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks for that. Maybe that's what you're getting at more. So yeah, so yeah, so definitely biases in the, in the model physics are, could be playing a big role here for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Kyle. Okay. Uh, there's a couple more questions and comments on Slack, but after we give the synthesis, we're going to have another hour of discussion uh, with all three of us on stage, so we can we can continue that conversation and we'll go through those points uh, in the discussion. Okay, we'll try to keep this short. We were so amazed uh, uh, about the uh, uh, interest. We had tons of atten attendees. We actually had two conferences. If you were on Slack, you saw like sometimes there were two full blown discussions going on in parallel. Last night, Christy and I tried to summarize the breakouts um, and we stopped at half past 12. So maybe it's not the best summary. Um, but it was kind of tough. <laughs> so um, we had more than 100 people on Slack. We will keep Slack open just to, to get you a sense of how much we try to aggregate. Um, let's talk about the posters uh, uh, at the end of, uh, of our little summary. So what we will be doing is walking through these four general themes. And for every uh, each of these themes, uh, we identified the the not the most pressing, uh, very, <laughs> here it starts. I can't even formulate our own questions. So the orange things are questions, open issues, and the green things are uh, ways forward. So we will walk through these four quadrants. 
and then we'll go from there. Uh, actually, before that, Jenny, would you be able to put the link to this in the Slack channel? Yes, I can do that. Okay. Because there's a lot of text, uh, we figured we'd also share this presentation to everybody on Slack. So if you want to go back and, and read through it, um, you can. As Maria said, it was very hard to aggregate everything. So we kind of highlighted the themes and the questions that kept coming up over and over uh, in all of the working group discussions and on Slack and so on. And it seemed like the one that kept coming up the most was this question of understanding the recent past and its implications for the near future. And I think Kyle gave a very good summary of that, where we really need to understand the drivers of the recent past trends, because there are very different implications, whether it's a forced response to greenhouse gases, to non-greenhouse gases, and as Kyle has shown, that has big implications for the near future and for long-term climate sensitivity. But it's not just the long-term climate sensitivity issue. We could see very different warming over the next couple of decades based on our interpretation of the recent past. Another big question that kept coming up is how do we compare models and observations? And if we think they're wrong, how do we deal with natural variability if we can't fully trust the simulations and we have a short observational record and a sparse and noisy paleo record. And Pierce and Gita did a nice summary of that sort of line of question. And it starts with this issue of uh, do models and sorry, models and observations don't agree on SST patterns and TOA imbalance is the disagreement outside of our best estimate of internal variability? And if the answer is no, well, is there still anything important about where in the variability range the observations are? But if we're tilting towards yes, then there's three different options. Is there something wrong with the observations? And I think Peter showed nicely that yes, there is. Is that enough? It's an open question. Um, is there something wrong with the modeled natural variability range? That's a big open question. Again, the paleo record might help us here. Um, or if it's not something wrong with natural variability, then how different do the forcings have to be to make the models and observations disagree? Is that within our uncertainty of different forcing types? If it's yes, then it means we need to figure out if the forcings are right, if no, then it's about how does the model response uh, differ the outer edges of the plausible range for the different forcing types, right? So there, there's a lot of different interpretations of the recent record, and as Kyle has shown, that has very different implications for what we might see um, in both the near and long-term future. What we really liked, so the questions I think are, I hope are pretty clear after a week of, of sort of going over them. What I really liked was there were a lot of fairly concrete ways forward, and we've summarized them on this slide. And I'm not really gonna, oops, um, I'm not gonna go through all of them. I've shared this slide on this slide on Slack. We're gonna share with all the participants so you can see uh, what everybody suggested. But there are a couple of, of sort of things that have stood out. Obviously, as it's often the case with these workshops, there's a long list of model run wish list. Uh, a lot of them have to do with understanding the coupled response uh, using flux corrected simulations to correct the climatology, flux adjusted simulations, uh, freshwater forcing simulations, wind nudge simulations to get at the SST patterns in a coupled framework. Uh, high resolution could play a role. There's been a lot of um, interesting suggestions for how to better investigate natural variability uh, using the paleo record, using other observations. Um, and there's been, I think, there's been a renewed interest in quantifying uncertainty in observational products, both in terms of SST, TOA, and so on. So I encourage you to, to, to look at this uh, more and we can discuss it as well. But this has been, I think, the, the, the main theme that has um, 
came across over and over again. So the, te uh, the second theme we identified was the conceptual and mechanistic understanding. The wish list of, oh, we wish we would understand this, uh, focuses on the Pacific, both the tropical uh, and mid-latitude uh, Pacific, so understanding the uh, mostly low frequency variability, go towards more understanding to, from Southern Ocean teleconnections to the Pacific, how can we relate um, variability to trends? What, what's the link between potential biases, or no, actual existing biases <laughs> and the trends? Um, and my, my personal favorite uh, hypothesis came from Ula uh, towards the end of her talk that the regions uh, which, with, uh, which show delayed warming, and we are quite confident in that these are actual regions which should show delayed warming might actually in the observations show cooling because of a potential uh, self-reinforcing feedback of, uh, of strong temperature gradients, uh, winds potentially linked to upwelling. This is very much uh, hypothesizing, but shows us to the degree to which we do not understand uh, uh, very basic processes. Then the second um, larger theme would be the frameworks. Uh, which I admittedly think we we started, but we didn't go into as much depth as for the other um, subjects. Maybe we can pick up this a little bit today with the Green's function, but um, how can we reformulate energy balance uh, models? How do we differentiate uh, nonlinearities, spatial nonlinearities, the cross terms um, and uh, temperature dependent feedbacks, uh, and the linear framework we we try to get to better understanding through the Green's function work. And then the third large theme would be the links between uh, ocean heat uptake and the changing feedbacks. Do they, in how far do they relate to each other over which timescales? When does this potential correlation in some regions break on longer timescales? And how far is ocean heat uptake? And how, how far should we move our understanding of ocean heat uptake away from the global mean temperature sets it to also more of a pattern uh, thinking? And the, the wish list continues. More fancier Green's functions in the couple system. Mechanism denial runs. I just highlight a few here. Um, we should flesh out our understanding of the existing indices, and there were some new indices were proposed, such as the SST sharp um, or uh, Green's function weighted EOFs. I think that there is a, is a lot of uh, space there to play around. And I think currently we have a handful of indices, but they are mostly shown to work very well in one model or for one model generation. So, but to actually fully understand these, there is uh, quite some space. Moving to non-geographical spaces. Um, and admittedly, we kind of stumbled on the how to move forward with the theory. Like we did not really think so deeply about innovative approaches to increase process understanding, uh, targeted idealized experiments uh, to test a little sharper hypothesis there. This might be something we could pick up uh, in the discussion. Just to follow up, I think when we say we here, we just don't, we don't necessarily mean Maria and I. It felt like from the summer of the discussion, there's a long wish list of we need to understand these things better conceptually, but it wasn't clear how we go about building those conceptual models other than you know, big GCMs. And so the other theme that, that, that came up um, is, is the need for better empirical constraints. Uh, and that's sort of actually twofold. Um, one is we don't even have a very good understanding of the range of the possible magnitude of the pattern effect in GCMs. Uh, I think there's some papers out in press or in review that expand that, but for the Sherwood et al. and AR6, there really are only a handful of models where we have all the simulations we need to really understand the full possible range of the pattern effect. 
uh, only a handful of Green's functions. So even within the model range, we don't have a full quantification of the under of the uncertainty. And then once we quantify it, we would like to constrain it. There's a nice line in the Sherwood at all uh, along the lines of the complete lack of observational constraints on the pattern effect means we can't contain constrain the upper range of ECS from the observational record. So we need better observational constraints. And the big questions are, well, how do we do that? And what observations and simulations uh, do we need uh, in order to, to, to better constrain both near-term and long-term pattern effect? Right now, we're very heavily relying on a small, on a relatively small model subset. The nice thing here is for a lot of these issues, there were very concrete ways forward. And some are relatively, we hope relatively easy. We just need more model runs to diagnose the forcing. Come on. We're forcing these models and we don't really know what we're forcing them with. Uh, so more RF MIP. Uh, another one that a lot of people that came up, I think, in every one of the working groups is extend the AMIP simulations to match the series record so we can do this observation consistently. Another one that I highlighted is, okay, we want longer observations, we want better observations. We need to be able to quantify that. We need to be able to assess the record length, the accuracy, the resolution that we need in order to constrain ECS. And this is, a lot of it comes from norms sort of saying, well, if you want a longer record, you need to tell me how long and, and what it would be useful for. We think that once we do these studies, we're going to find out that, yes, it'd be great if the series record uh, continues, if the Argo record continues. Uh, but I think one of the things was we need to be able to quantitatively articulate why we need these longer records and what exactly it's going to do, it's going to do for us. Um, the one part that there wasn't a lot of is, you know, what is a framework for placing empirical constraints? Do we use emergent constraints? We've just seen that those can be tricky. We don't, I don't think we have a very good framework for how we would actually place empirical constraints on the pattern effect in any of its definitions. So something else to think about uh, during the discussion. Last one is using all the usefulness, potential usefulness of the paleo record. Can we use the record for constraining equilibrium patterns? Do these equilibrium patterns actually relate at all to our future equilibrium? May they be used to constrain, they are actually used to constrain ECS. Are these constraints uh, trustable? Is the understanding of the paleo patterns and how far do we link this to, to, to increase or decrease our trust in, in our GCMs? And on the somewhat shorter time, time scale, uh, last millennium or so, can we use uh, paleo records to constrain the decadal variability um, of our models or our understand before the models of our understanding of uh, decadal variability? Uh, a big theme coming up again and again is the understanding the limitations and uncertainties of these records. And this is especially relevant for our community as mostly we are not actually understanding these properly. Um, Period. Another theme, which was kind of a cross theme, is the temperature uh, feedback dependence. So this is also or larger in um, state dependence in a larger sense, continental configuration, vegetation, ice sheets. How do we separate out these additional feedbacks and still make uh, paleo records useful for uh, the more close future? The suggestions went into the directions or in the direction of coming up with more paleo patterns, um, integrate across different, different uh, observations or proxies, uh, and basically get as much as possible on one map, even if it's uh, for different timescales potentially, using other than SST variables. Um, and basically, it's all about quantifying the uncertainty. It's a little, I feel it's a little lame that we say this and say, hey, please, paleo folks, get us the uncertainty. 
and it's very likely going hand in hand, but it's uh, just something which came up uh, a lot. Some people, including Torsten, for example, just raised the flag of, hey, let's not jump to the paleo pattern effect too quickly without forgetting actual forcings the feedback uncertainty. So we, we, we should not forget that there's also, uh, that the uncertainty in the feedbacks themselves might be larger than the uncertainty in the pattern effect. Or oh, this is also something we, should, we, we might wanna quantify and not forget the deep convection schemes, please. That's it. So we will leave this uh, up. We will come back to the main slide. Okay, should I go through this? Do you want to do it? Go ahead. Um, sorry, this uh, the formatting got changed a bit. Uh, so before we just jump into the discussion, we just for a few minutes want to talk about what happens next. Uh, the online poster gallery is going to stay open. Um, so please, if you haven't had a time to check out all of the amazing posters and all of the amazing signs that. I had no idea personally what was being done by the community and it's, it's been so nice to see um, how promising the near future is, if not in terms of global warming, then at least in terms of global warming science. Um, the Slack will stay open. The Slack will stay open at least for another week or two. Please continue to ramble, uh, to reach out to other people. There's a, if you go back, there's a very rich conversation with side threads. We're going to use a lot of that in the, in, the, in the workshop report, so at least until the workshop report is done, the Slack channel is going to stay open. Uh, we're going to put together a workshop report, uh, submitted at least through Clivar, possibly as a BAMS uh, report, and we will elicit feedback uh, on it. So all of you will have a chance uh, to, to give feedback on that report to make sure, you know, um, your perspective wasn't uh, wasn't missed, uh, and then this is still TBD. We would like uh, to to write a review paper um, on the topic. We'll reach out to a few people, but if anybody is very keen on participating in this review paper, reach out to us, and um, uh, we can talk about it. And with that, we're gonna leave up this summary so you can digest it more uh, and we're going to continue into a discussion. I think we'd like Kyle here. People seem to like asking questions of Kyle, so we'd like to invite him back up. Um, but this is really an, an open discussion. This is sort of the last, um, the last chance dance. And Jenny, would you be able to? We wanted the whole sock. Oh yeah, the whole, well, uh, yeah, Norm and Sarah are still here, sorry. I thought no, Natalie's still here. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, sorry, we actually didn't warn you. This is the worst last minute. Yeah. If you fancy, why don't you come up? Yeah. I would also like to point out that Jonathan is online, and I think so is Piers. Piers and Jonathan, you are on a panel now. <laughs> Just so you know. Pierce said he can throw through at you guys. <laughs> We're ending on a strong organizational note. Right, you're still here. <laughs> yeah, so they just invited the organizing committee and the speakers from today up on the panel. Um, so Pierce and Jonathan, if you want to be participate, feel free to turn on your camera. All right, do we have any questions for any of these members? Or any comments about the workshop? Any questions for anybody else in the audience as well? I think there were some on Slack from before. Um, perhaps I can ask one, if that's okay. Ms. P? And... Yes. Um, I want to know about timescales. I mean, we talked about things having different timescales. I, I do wonder if that's something that we can constrain. I'm thinking particularly for the projections. Or, or does everything operate on all time scales? I guess it particularly relates to 
can Kyle's talk about how rapidly things take to recover back to their ECS. It's a good question. Kyle, do you want to take it? Sure, I, uh, Kyle here. I, I, I'm not sure I have any great insights there. <clears throat> I think I think uh, I would just say that to answer that question, I think we really need to answer what has caused the pattern in the last 40 years, right? It, it very much depends on whether it's forced by freshwater or it's just internal variability or response to ozone or or a, just the natural response to CO2 forcing. I mean, all of those come with different time scale, uh, you know, predicted, predicted time scales of changes for the future. So I guess my, my initial guess is this is mostly variability, in which case we should see something kind of revert back to a more forced response in the near term. However, in the new work by various folks kind of pointing to the potential for meltwater from Antarctica playing a role, that, that gives me some pause there, right? Because that, that's going to continue, if not accelerate in the future. And so I, I really truly can't answer that. I, and I think that's a, a really good discussion point for the, for the whole community. Like, can we identify the mechanisms? And if so, then we can start to make better projections for the future. The only thing well, could... well, perhaps, sorry, Guy, to interrupt. But that, that what I'm asking is, could, can we, can we constrain the time scale of the different mechanisms? I mean, bef, 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 it, that that could be rather independently of, kind of what has caused it. I just think if it's kind of worth understanding the time scales independently. I mean, I, I would say at least for the meltwater, we might want to turn to the paleo record, right? <laughs> it's one example where maybe we could get some insights. I know we have examples for the Northern Hemisphere, um, but Southern Hemisphere, I, I, I don't know, I, nothing comes to mind in terms of paleo constraints on an Arctic Machi rate of melt, but I'm sure there are plenty of studies out there. I just had a thought about the meltwater, uh, just very simple thinking. If global warming is causing the melting, then the climate system is trying to adjust and, and producing cooling in these regions where you get, you know, the strong impact on lambda. So it's sort of helping to bring bring the planet into a little more uh, balance. Would you say conceptually? Uh, yeah, that that seems like the right sign of the response. But I think we're uh, all it does is make lambda more negative. It doesn't stop warming globally, right? But it but it um, it slows down warming by some amount. But I, I think the simulation I showed shows it slows it down by one degree or something over the 21st century compared to a rise of at least for the RCP 8.5 scenario, a rise of five becomes four or six becomes five. But so it's a relatively small effect in that sense. Of course, that's, that scenario is obviously too high emissions, but the same plays out for lower emissions too. I, I, so Pierce, I, I don't think I fully understood your question. I, I think, are you just saying, could we just play out the thought experiment of if it's variability, what would be the time scale? If it's meltwater, what would be the time scale and try to quantify each of them separately? Yes, I do think I kind of was doing that because then that might set some sort of pounds of some kind of what we might expect to occur within the next decades in some way. So, so perhaps we can at least begin to come up with some thought experiment and perhaps begin to make something of a testable hypothesis, you know, kind of, kind of, Kind of well, like what people did when kind of Pinatubo went off, they had a kind of prediction. So perhaps we could we we could come up with a set of predictions about the way things could change. It could be caused by a particular mechanism, and then by the time we do know which it is, I'll probably be well dead by that time. But perhaps some of the good, bright, young kind of PhDs in the audience will have the answer. <laughs> can I can I add just one more thing to that? I think I understand where you're going with that, I, and it's a really good idea. I would say one more thing, which is I think our big problem right now is that all these potential mechanisms project on the exact same pattern, basically, and so in PDO dynamics. I think the next 10 years of observations are going to really tell us a lot, because if something changes in the pattern, like if we if the pattern reverses and meltwater continues, well, that probably wasn't the driving mechanism, right? So I think I think 
thinking a little bit about as a community what observing systems we need in place for when the pattern changes or maybe it doesn't i think will help us so in 10 years we're not stuck having the same conversations we can actually observe the changes and be prepared to say our hypothesis was that if meltwater continues freshwater continues to cool the southern ocean through stratification changes well we have the observing systems in place to continue to see that or series does this so I, I really like this, this approach of coming up with testable hypotheses so we're prepared and when we reconvene in 10 years for the next pattern effect workshop, maybe it's not going to be annual, um, we can have answered this question with observations. So is 10 years enough? It's, it's the question. It's a question for you to follow up. There's a comment from Jonathan Gregory. It could be that the IPL PDL pattern is something that coupled system tr tends to do in response to unforced variability or some kind of external forcing. Yeah, it could be a, a preferential mode of the system. Uh, and if, if, if that's the case and we think it's the case, then a large number of both external forcing and internal variability drivers are going to project on it. And you see it, and you, it, it is, right? We sort of know that it's a preferential mode. You see it in, even in slab simulations and coupled simulations. How do we go forward from that? Maybe we need to look at second order statistics and say, okay, yes, yeah, sure. This, this sort of, I think Chris called it the, the number three pattern uh, in the equatorial Pacific is gonna come up regardless, but what are the second order statistics? What else does this, does that hypothesis predict? And you should find differences. Um, I guess my one example of that is the AMV, the Atlantic uh, Multidecadal Variability, uh, the formerly known as the AMO, um, where there was this long discussion about is this pattern caused by uh, atmospheric dynamics that's just passively amplified by uh, the thermodynamic ocean, or is there are the ocean dynamics uh, involved as well? And it turned out you could generate that pattern both with ocean dynamics and with atmospheric dynamics. So the pattern itself wasn't enough to tell you, but there were differences in, in there were more subtle differences both in the spatial pattern and especially once you start looking at other things like heat flux. Then this is not my area, so I'm sorry if I'm saying something wrong. But once you moved away from just this generic warming hole and you looked at some of the details and some of the fluxes the different hypotheses predicted different things uh, and i think that's where th that that's where progress can be made but clara or rob or, or rob is already stepping up might have some thoughts on lessons we might learn from the amo amv community yeah a uh, bit, bit more of a comment but thanks for making that point christy that there are these subtle differences in spatial patterns that can give you different insights because so, so in, in some sense we see this triangular looking pattern and always say IPO and there can still be subtle differences between if it's forced by the southern ocean and it maybe has more of the southern part of this if it's uh, coming from the tropics it maybe weights more of the tropical part of it if it's uh, PDO, uh, it maybe has more of the North Pacific part of it. And these subtle differences can give it, uh, physical insights. And this has been helpful in the AMO, AMV community to say this, this subpolar part of it is related to AMOC and this more tripolar warm, cold, warm pattern is related to atmospheric forcing. Uh, you can also look at different patterns of external forcing. So pay attention to these subtle spatial pattern differences. So this is the pattern effect community, I, I think they can give you additional insights. And um, again, I'm not very familiar with that. So maybe you can comment one, on one more thing. It did seem like they did try to really try to understand how these different hypotheses would project, right? Like there were all sorts of idealized experiments, uh, which I don't think have really been done quite as much for, for the Pacific to to understand how these different hypotheses project, but maybe that's just my very vague and removed understanding of that literature. For the AMB, you mean? Um, it, there's there's a whole spectrum of different methods you could use, uh, ranging from and have been used for the AMB, and I agree to a lesser extent for the Pacific, of looking at slab versus coupled runs and comparing what's different about their patterns of variability. Um, looking at 
have patterns of variability different between different time scales, looking at how relationship between surface fluxes and SST is different between different time scales. Thank you. I want to make a comment. Um, so I think we're um, we tend to separate the internal variability and the forced response. But uh, the internal variability can be also modulated by the forcing. And I think that's a big um, question in the community. And actually, I'd like to advertise that there is another um, Cliver workshop where Clara is actually invited as a speaker. And Natalie is also a committee um, that's going to be explicitly about how the internal variability is modulated by external forcing. And that's going to be virtual in September. So please stay tuned. There were two questions online that are very related to each other uh, by Yen Ting and Brian. Um, they're both curious about Antarctic freshwater forcing. Do we expect more freshwater as the climate warms, leading to cooling in the Southern Ocean and East Pacific? Whereas the freshwater occurred in the previous decades may explain that the models do not get a historical warming, maybe more its natural variability. So I guess even if the even if this pattern was natural variability, would we still expect it in the future due to meltwater forcing? It's a very interesting question. Um, and then Brian also asks, how well do we understand the mechanisms um, that give rise to cooling in response to to meltwater forcing? Is it mostly sea ice? Trying to wrap my head around the interactions of fresh water, stratification, ice. Uh, and changes to ocean heat uptake. So the cooling effect of uh, meltwater in the historical period, I think that's very model dependent. So at least based on um, US um, CSM result, you actually need tons of um, unrealistically um, strong meltwater um, in the historical to actually um, have the cooling as in the observation. But actually from GFDL model, which was published in 2018, um, they actually in the paper, they only talk about the future scenario of future, but um, I looked at the historical period in their, their model and you can actually get the, the, the observed cooling uh, just by the meltwater. So there is a, I think it's a big uh, model dependence in there. And maybe I should just clarify the mechanism behind this. My, my very first order picture of this is the Southern Ocean is a place where you have cold fresh water over warm salty water. And so it's an upward flux of heat to the surface. And Jonathan Gregory is probably cringing and going to kill me here. But the basic idea is uh, it's an upward flux from the deep ocean to the surface. And so when you stratify by adding more fresh water, it basically reduces that upward flux of heat and warms at depth and cools the surface. And that's what you see in the observations. But multiple things might do that. Winds could also cause the same kind of cooling at the surface with warm and below. So there's multiple mechanisms that could have caused those observations, but it's true that the surfaces have been freshening and we, it may be meltwater that's causing it. Um, but others, others like Andrew's an expert here in terms of his runs, but also uh, how, how he kind of put quantified that, that meltwater. But I agree with you, Sarah, I think it's an incredibly model dependent question. So it's just one of many plausible hypotheses right now for what happened. In the southern ocean cooling in the historical period, um, I think, um, so. There, there are, there is a community who thinks um, that's um, driven by the IPO, positive IPO. Um, but um, the positive IPO um, related Southern Ocean cooling is also underestimated in models. Um, I think that's because of the cloud field effect. So if the internal variability um, component to the Southern Ocean is also underestimated. So I think it's really uh, difficult uh, to disentangle whether it's the forced or the um, internally generated. Just make one comment about uh, coming back to model resolution. So with CESM1, there's the typical one degree model, coupled model, and then there's this 0.1 degree ocean model, quarter degree atmosphere, the high resolution. The latter, as Sally showed, has very large multi-decadal internal variability of southern ocean deep convection and this pattern, uh, whereas the low the typical low resolution model does not. So again, I think these wide open questions about the magnitude of the internal variability and the pattern may be dependent on this uh, resolution in the, in the ocean. Thank you. Yeah, there's, it's 
Ah, anyways, so Kyle, Jonathan does have two comments. Oh no! Online, can we go to can we go to Mark instead? <laughs> uh, the first one is I'm not cringing. Okay. The second one is can we exclude the possibility of the recent pattern being an equilibrium response to greenhouse gas forcing? If it was, wouldn't there be paleo evidence for it, um, such as from the Pliocene? It could also be a transient response to greenhouse gas forcing, which we wouldn't be able to see in the paleo record. I think Natalie has. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think that, I think there's enough within the uncertainty of the proxies to rule out the current day pattern as being a Pliocene pattern. I, I can say that much. Um, there is obviously uncertainty in the proxy data for how much warmer the warm pool was in the Pliocene. So that's one of the areas where we need more constraints. Um, but certainly, you know, one thing that's really nice about the Pliocene pattern is you see some dynamical consistency. So, for example, all the upwelling regions, for example, the Benguela, maybe about 10 degrees warmer than, than modern. Um, you know, the California upwelling region, warmer, uh, some of the sites in sort of um, the other upwelling regions. So, this, this, the fact that the thermocline was, you know, the, 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 the thermocline borders that were, the ventilated thermocline waters that were feeding into these upwelling regions were, were warmer. Is there's a consistent story there across different regions in the proxy data? So I think we there's a dynamical pattern that makes sense across the proxy data for the Pliocenes. Um, can I can I ask a quick follow up? Do we have more confidence in the polar amplification pattern than we do the east west temperature gradients in the Pacific, or or would you say that they're both? Equally certain. Uh, I I would agree with that in the sense that you know the high latitude warming patterns are are um, are pretty clear across the data. But for that, I mean, Paul would have you know fifty north. The Southern Ocean is very poorly constrained. Um, so, but uh, then in terms of like the the gradient between the mid latitudes and the deep tropics, that's that's less well constrained, and it has important implications for the hydrological cycle. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say something about it, uh, empirical constraints. Um, I think, you know, in ECS world, not in pattern effect world, but just thinking about ECS, we've made a lot of progress on constraining the process that we think really matters, which is the cloud feedback. And that actually ends up being a lot of the story for the pattern effect too. Um, and, and, you know, focusing on cloud, uh, cloud responses to their environment has been really powerful for trying to constrain how clouds will respond in the future. And so I think a lot of those same constraints can be applied here. Um, obviously, it's only one part, it's, you know, one part of the story. The other part is the evolving patterns of warming. But we do actually have really good observations of clouds and their environment and how those are changing uh, during the satellite record. And this is a little bit of a plug for Tim Meyer's poster that has tried to essentially constrain at least the response of clouds um, to different warming patterns, assuming the warming patterns are correct, um, how much the cloud radiative impact would be. Um, we can do that. We don't have to rely solely on models. We can, you know, do these kinds of empirical constraints on, you know, piecemeal parts of the story. So how sensitive are clouds to their environment? We can pin that down pretty well, actually, from from observations. So doing the these constraints, um, you know, in kind of more of a piecemeal way, I think, is really useful. And you know, we learned that lesson in with ECS. A lot of the emergent constraints that are trying to use some current climate observable and constrain ECS are mostly dubious, and they fall apart when you test them out of sample. Um, but when you look at individual processes that you know matter. Um, those can be a little bit more reliable and seem to be more powerful. So I think similar approaches in the in pattern effect world are could be really powerful. Um, so I guess that's kind of more of a of a comment than a question. But maintaining the satellite cloud record, I think, is really crucial. Maintaining the satellite TOA record is super cr critical um, for allowing us to do these sorts of things. Um, and again, that's only one part of the story. Obviously, the SST patterns are super important, and I don't have really great ideas for how to constrain that. But we know that the cloud. Cloud part, the clouds are a huge part of the story, and, and we're getting better at constraining how they should respond without having to rely solely on what models tell us. So, thanks. So, uh, this on? Yeah, so thanks for the plug, Mark. Um, but you can imagine taking like a more general approach. So, in the past like five, 10 years, there's been a lot of much greater understanding of cloud feedback response to increasing CO2, kind of the, in this idealized framework. And that's, um, 
a variety of evidence, not just observational constraints, but like um, uh, theoretical understanding, large eddy simulations, cloud resolving models, et cetera. And that's embodied in the Sherwood et al. approach to creating best estimates of cloud feedback to increasing CO2, and then using that in this piecemeal approach to their by constraint ECS. I'm wondering if a similar approach could be used to create best historical estimates of cloud feedbacks over the last 40 years, 50 years, even longer time scale, but over the historical period, um, obviously the SST pattern and then uh, therefore large scale forcings differ between the historical period and the um, uh, what you get for increasing CO2. So, we, so maybe it doesn't make sense for the cloud feedback community to use this kind of holistic approach, observational constraints, large eddy simulations, et cetera, to create maybe best estimates of what the cloud feedback, other feedback should have been over the historical record, because then you have two best estimates of the feedback, increasing CO2, uh, recent historical period, and the difference presumably should be uh, a constraint on the pattern effect. I just want to say totally agree with this common to concern cloud feedbacks in aspheric model physics. Um, actually, if well, the earlier talk you heard, if counting of uh, counting for pattern effects would change the upper or lower bound in ECS, but if our focus is to reduce the model spread in ECS estimate, we actually have a paper 2020 to look at how much of the uh, uh, intermodal spread in ECS estimate across semi five or semi six models is coming from differences in model simulated SSC patterns versus model uh, differences in model physics or atmospheric physics, cloud physics, prepositions. So actually, most of the variance in model simulated ECS is, is not coming from difference, differences in SSC patterns. It's mostly coming from uh, atmospheric physics or cloud physics, cloud prepositions. So I mean, my interpretation is that a bad result is that constraining, if you want, top priority is to constrain model spread in ECS and probably constraining cloud physics or cloud feedback is more essential or more effective than constraining long-term projected SD patterns. I'm gonna jump back like 10 minutes to Christy's comment about AMV and everything. Um, so I've been running, <laughs> I've been running um, uh, model hierarchy. So uh, we can have slab ocean models, but then you can also um, only have uh, the climatology effects of the wind stress driven ocean circulation. Um, and thinking about that as a more full uh, model hierarchy in terms of what role do ocean dynamics play in various processes. And this has some similarities to a lot of what was done with AMV. I don't know exactly how that would fit into this framework, but these model runs exist. And if people have ideas for how we could use these to pick out either what's unknown about the ocean circulation component of this, or how that's feeding back on the atmosphere, I'd love to collaborate with people. Um, and then there are also some other ongoing developments with uh, what's called pencil ocean models, um, where you basically only have vertical ocean dynamics and not horizontal. Um, don't know when those runs are gonna be done, but these are things that are going to exist. Um, the data will be made publicly available. Happy to collaborate with people if there are ideas on how to use that. Hi, so this is a little bit of a follow on to Wei's comment and to, to some of the stuff Kyle showed. Um, and Kyle, you sort of pointed out that if you uh, uh, pr prescribe a pattern similar to well, you know, observations that even the high sensitivity models have a, you know, an effective, a low effective pattern sensitivity, and that maybe if you continue to prescribe something similar to that into the future, that you don't see much of a spread in the projected warming. Um, given that uh, you were saying that the atmospheric physics, like the actual model physics is what causes the spread uh, between the behaviors of different climate models, does that mean that that spread is associated with regions that haven't started to warm yet? So, you know, and does that also mean that there's gonna be some time beyond which, you know, our projection, should we think of it in terms of up until a certain point, our projections will have a pretty narrow uncertainty, but then beyond that, there'll be this sort of opening up of many different pathways of what could follow beyond that. And, we have a, and if that's the case, we have a sense of when that time would be, you know, when suddenly there could be these much warmer pathways that can emerge. 
Yeah, I, th I think that's the right way to think about it. Just that if, as long as the East Pacific and Southern Ocean are cooling and the West Pacific is warming, that's a very negative feedback state. So ECS effective climate sensitivity is very low, independent of how positive the cloud feedbacks are in those other regions. So when those regions start to warm, you expose yourself to a lot of uncertainty because they could be high, uh, could you could become very high sensitivity or stay low sensitivity depending on the cloud physics in those regions. So I think that's very consistent with what uh, UA has said, where in the coupled models, most of the spread in ECS is just coming from cloud physics because their four times CO2 patterns of warming are not that different from one another, but they're all very different from the observations. And so the difference between the observed pattern versus the four times CO2 pattern projects very much onto that uncertainty in ECS, which is why all models have very low effective sensitivity when they get forced with that observed pattern. But then when you give them their own patterns of projections, it exposes those models to very high ECS when their cloud physics is very uh, favorable for high ECS. I'm not sure that totally made sense, but I think I agree with what you brought up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I have one quick comment on the cloud discussion. Uh, almost more as a question or warning that in as far as the SST was peculiar, might have been peculiar over the last 40 years, the cloud feedbacks also may be um, slash in the future, we might be in totally different cloud feedback spaces as the Southern Ocean warms and so on. So I feel there's a whole other thing of seeing in how far the observed, even if we understand them very well, the observed cloud feedbacks uh, will inform the future. Can, can Mark or, or, or Tim either, either one speak to that question of what the cloud feedbacks have done in the recent record versus the future? No, I totally agree. Like, um, I guess my comment was more like, given what, given a particular SST pattern, what should the feedback be? So it kind of hedges on the question of what is anomalous about the SST pattern or what the, will the SST pattern and associated large scale environmental changes that control clouds, how, you know, what causes that? But it's, it's more of a question of constraining the feedback portion of the pattern effect. So given a particular pattern, um, regardless of its cause, what should the feedback uh, should be? Because as we know, many, uh, it seems like right now we're relying a lot on what uh, model feedback show in terms of their differences to um, a given SST pattern. So yeah, but yeah, point taken. I would, <clears throat> I would just counter that a little bit that we're not trying to constrain cloud feedback using trends at all. Um, we haven't, I don't think anybody has tried to constrain cloud feedback using the observed trends. Partly because the cloud, you know, cloud observations are not that long and we don't really trust the trends from them anyway. So it's uh, a lot of the constraints on clouds have been at the very process level. How sensitive is a cloud here to estimated inversion strength or SST? So it's a little bit um, on interannual timescales, which actually do have quite a large variance relative to, you know, the, the climate change. So um, I think that's comforting in some ways that you're, you're we're not tethered to some kind of observed pattern. It's a very diverse set of patterns that uh, environmental controls that are changing in the observed record that we're using to capitalize to try to estimate these sensitivities of clouds to their uh, controlling factors. Um, there's there's still uncertainties there, of course, but we're not, um, you know, uh, the fact that the warming pattern has been very strange or outside the range of what we, uh, what models can do, I think is not, doesn't preclude our ability to uh, really estimate how sensitive clouds are to their environment. Can I just quickly ask a question? I mean, but I, one takeaway from the Chen's paper in 2016, which you're on, which I think was foundational in my thinking on this, was there's been a growth of low clouds in the East Pacific over the cooling in that region, which is very consistent with a positive low cloud feedback, right? So then when that region will warm up in the future, if it does, that would become a, a positive feedback that enhances warming. So maybe we can't quantify the cloud feedback from that, but the sign is at least very consistent with our thinking in the pattern effect, right? Yeah, I okay. think that's right. Um, if you if you do actually look at the trends in clouds, and you should look at them with a huge grain of salt, but you know these kind of artifact corrected cloud trends do match what you what the models tell you that they should do, which is to grow um, where there's delayed warming. So we did see that in these uh, satellite you know corrected uh, artifact corrected satellite trends, um, but generally that's not what we're using for our constraints on how sensitive clouds are to to their environment. Those are um, a little bit more of maybe a, a less rigorous just um, validation that, you know, the, the mechanisms that we have in mind are actually being manifest in the real world to some extent. I, I have a, sorry. Go ahead. 
So on that, I think you're right. They seem to be doing the right thing in the right place, but they're not, maybe the magnitudes are too small. So we're seeing, at least for the atmosphere only HEMIP type simulations from the last 20 years, I was surprised how well they got the patterns responding to changes in SST, but there was still this thing where they, they were kind of underestimating the pattern effect. And um, so how close do you need to be using the current record to trust projections forward? Is that even a question we should be asking or <laughs> we're not there yet? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I'm not saying that the models are right. I think they do actually have pretty se severe biases in how sensitive clouds are to their environment and that really manifests in um, these sorts of things. And that's why I think that potentially some of the internal variability in, in SST gradients might be underestimated because clouds aren't responding properly to, to the strengthening inversion. And if they're not, then perhaps they're not feeding back properly on the gradients themselves. Um, so if you look kind of at a broad scale, it looks like the models are doing kind of okay in getting the cloud responses. But um, when you look at, at a detailed level, a lot of the, the magnitude can be uh, severely underestimated in some models. So I totally agree with you. Um, My question was kind of similar to norms in the sense that, you know, I'm not, I haven't kept up with that literature, but in terms of the sort of response, cloud response to ENSO in a given coupled model or La Nina, how well does that sort of map to the, the responses to their transient and then equilibrium um, patterns? Is there, you know, I'm just thinking in terms of ones that do a kind of cloud response that maybe matches the observations better in response to an El Nino event or a Nino event. And then can you, has it been any sort of stratification then in terms of their response to warming patterns there's work in progress on that i mean we sort of it's saw these lead lag relationships that were promising comparing observations and models i think we saw some this week and i know kevin trenberth and john fasulo had done some and i think they they did reasonably well at least getting the statistical lead lag radiation versus say the nino index um, so that part of it, but your other, the other part of your question is more difficult to answer. <laughs> part two. I'll... I, would, I could I would... at least say that in, oh, sorry, I, I cut somebody off. So there is a strong correlation between the cloud response to El Nino and the historical pattern effect. Stay tuned for more work on that. So yeah, that is, I, I think it's a promising line of evidence. I was uh, just gonna say that there's evidence from work that Chen Zhou did that the kind of feedback, that op, cloud feedback that operates on interannual variability and like a PI control run is very well correlated across models with uh, the long-term, you know, in response to forex CO2. But I think that relates primarily to what UA was pointing out is that there's a huge intermodel spread in just how sense uh, in essentially cloud physics, how clouds are represented in models, and that manifests on both of those timescales. So that the ordering of the models on short-term uh, feedback in response to say things like El Nino is, you know, they're the same order of the models that are operating on the long term. So I don't know how much that's related to the pattern effect as much as just intermodel differences in um, how clouds are represented. Yeah, I do want to take some questions from the Slack, because there's been a, three questions basically on the same theme. Um, and it starts, I guess, with Angie um, pointing out that there has been work done before on the link between SST patterns uh, and regional precipitation. Uh, and we might want to look into the um, SST pattern formation framework that that literature used. Tim Andrews strongly endorsed that uh, and suggested that the pattern effect links to the hydrologic cycle too, uh, and that these sort of SST pattern changes have major influence on precipitation changes as well. Uh, and Amanda Maycock asks this in a slightly different format and says, what hasn't been talked about much is the implication of SST pattern for regional climate, e.g. via teleconnection. Right. There's other aspects of atmospheric circulation that affect uh, regional climate, not just ECS and global temperature. Uh, 
So what's the panel view on the importance of understanding SST patterns for other aspects of regional climate uh, versus just their effect on feedbacks and, and global warming? Uh, and I see other people have thoughts on this, so um, maybe we'll let Angie and Mal to answer first before uh, the panel. I don't have a question. I was going to mention that after that little exchange in the in the DMs, uh, Andrew Williams was pointing me to his poster that's online where he was uh, making some greens function like things for precipitation, which is pretty cool. Plug for Andrew's poster. Nice. Uh, just a quick comment on that question. I mean, there uh, we can, of course, look at the uh, decade-long research in, in El Nino research at pillar connections associated with variability on top of different mean states, and uh, there's a very rich uh, literature on there, and I, I totally agree. It's, it's, uh, the pattern is critical for those. But yeah, there's been a lot of work. Yeah, and I guess I don't. So one part of that that I'm not sure has been discussed enough is sort of this mismatch in patterns between observations and models and what implications that might have. Right? Kyle showed us some very nice plots about how these potentially large swings in Pacific SST patterns might have big impacts on near-term changes in in global warming rates. But we know that from the ENSO literature that these kind of patterns also affect things like Atlantic hurricanes, right? So if we switch from a couple of, from a couple of decades of um, more negative ENSO pattern to a couple of decades of more positive ENSO patterns, you know, in a way that's underestimated by the coupled models, could we have surprises in terms of the frequency of Atlantic hurricanes or regional precip or all these other things? I think these are interesting questions, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just add something? So one of the one of the really cool things that I found being at this meeting was just how how broad the definition of pattern effect has become within the community. Right? I think I had this very narrow conception, which is pattern effect is for radiation and ECS, but it's so cool seeing how much work is being done for things like precip or or regional patterns of temperature change. There's so much more you can do with this concept of pattern effect, right? It's much broader. But I'll flip that around. I mean, we guess one one quick example would be sea level rise. The fact that the, the greatest rates of sea level rise have been Western tropical Pacific. The small island nations are getting swamped right now. So the question of whether that's natural variability or force response is not just for radiation. It's also for climate impacts in those regions, right? If that reverses sign, then the walker circulation weakens again. You could, might expect the sea level rise to, to slow in those regions, right? So there are broader implications. But let's flip that around and also then maybe use those to get better reconstructions for the past, right? If if things like the walker circulation are linked to sea level rise and you have tide gauges, this was mentioned in our discussion yesterday or maybe the day before, who knows? Maybe the, those um, tide gauges can help you reconstruct SST patterns for the earliest 20th century and 19th century as you go back. So I think I think thinking more broadly about precip patterns, sea level rise, other uh, impacts on land can be helpful to get back to this radiation question when we start doing things like data assimilation for reconstructing the past record. So I think I think it's great that we have this broader view of the pattern effect in this community. Um, I guess uh, I guess I do have a comment to follow up on. So um, one of the things that um, Mark Linka had a poster about was the um, the time series of precipitation in AMIP simulations. Um, and this is an interesting question that I've always been very reluctant to wade into because it's so hard for precipitation. And the reason it's so hard for precipitation, I think harder than sea surface temperature, is that you can't get around the aerosol forcing and you can't get around the fact that we don't know very much about what the history of especially absorbing aerosol forcing was. It matters less for the global mean top of atmosphere radiative budget than it does for precipitation. But I think that brings, uh, that keeps in the forefront of my mind, the huge forcing uncertainty that there is on um, what the, the past history of aerosols was. And so for that, perhaps that's something to keep in mind for the pattern effect for sea surface temperature and radiative fluxes. Yeah. Um, I Let's see if there's any more. There's a comment from Pierre saying that it's Friday night and he's heading out for swim and beers. Uh, 
Um, so that might be a good point for us to. Oh, no, Kyle. Because you mentioned I mean, just the final point. I, I think Pierce's comment earlier was really insightful. Uh, just the, the I, I think what he was maybe getting at is, is maybe we can think of storyline approaches for what has caused the past and, and help us translate to the future, right? We don't know what's caused the past patterns, but depending on what that mechanism is, it makes very different predictions to the future. So just maybe something for, for this community to think about as we start to orient to writing review papers and summaries for the workshop would be, we can't answer these questions now, but we can at least list out all the hypotheses. If this storyline is what caused it, we can make this prediction, and these are the observations that would help nail that down. So I think, I think um, Piers before Beers said some things very insightful. Uh, so. That could be a good way to structure your papers. Everyone yeah. come with their own storyline. Very single right. favorite mechanism. <laughs> I'll make one last comment. This also seems like, especially based on the recent, the, the last few comments we read by um, Angie and Amanda and Tim. This is maybe a broader problem than just radiative feedbacks is patterns in the coupled climate system. And maybe that's the next WCRP lighthouse activity is a better understanding of SST patterns in the coupled climate system. That seems like a much broader problem than this originally started uh, in terms of just understanding the radiative feedbacks. And, and that ties into a lot of other communities. Since we're in Boulder, the most obvious one is the large ensemble community, but um, maybe that's another way forward is to try to bring together some of these different communities that think about SST patterns in the coupled climate system. Some very vague food for thought. I want to reinforce that point and remind everyone that um, we act at the couple, the climate system is actually coupled. And so changes in uh, circulation and in precipitation can feed back on the sea surface temperature and on radiative fluxes. So actually all of it matters, everything. It's a great point to end the, to end the, the mandatory part of the workshop on. So we got a short break or a ten, either a 10 minute break, oh, 15 past, until 15 past. Or a 10 year break until the next workshop if you're not hanging around for the for the GF MIP discussion, which I encourage you to do. Okay, thank you guys for uh, for uh, sticking around for this this uh, discussion. Um, I first I just um, I really want to thank the organizers. This has been a really wonderful week. I can't imagine a better way to sort of come back to in person meetings than this. Uh, than this week has been. I feel like uh, I've had. So many interesting discussions with people and learned so much science. So I just I'm just in a really happy place because of this week. So thank you. Oh, some more folks. Anyway, um, thanks. So thank you to Christine Maria for for all their work and for everyone else who's contributed to making this week so great. Um, um, the way this session this uh, this discussion is going to work is I'm first going to give some uh, some slides. I'm going to Sort of summarize some of the uh, results that have come as part of the preliminary work of trying to set up a GFMIP protocol. So this is some work that's come in collaboration with some of the people you've seen see up on the slide. Uh, it's been an interesting process trying to figure out a good protocol. It's a process that's ended up having its own sort of scientific content that's come out of it. But then we are trying to move towards some sort of agreed upon structure for how people should run Green's function. Uh, experiments in a consistent way across models so that differences between models really reflect the model physics as opposed to elements of the, the setups of the uh, of their greens functions. So uh, I don't I don't really need to I guess say this so much for this group because you're probably the group of people who are interested in learning more about greens functions but um, sorry the slides are um, so, why greens functions? Uh, let me, oh. So, like the the core idea of this is to help us understand pattern driven changes in radiative feedback. So that's just one piece of why we might want to do this. Uh, next slide. Um, I think oh, just to say one of the utilities of greens functions is it's just the the, the, the the sheer fact that it's expanded our way of thinking about feedbacks beyond just local radiative feedbacks. I think not not pointed this out. This panel discussion yesterday. Next slide. Um, one 
possible interesting thing is that it helps us to understand one of the branches in the many causal loops of sort of the full potentially spatial coupled system. Um, and next slide. Even when they fail, I think that they can help us learn interesting things about the climate and the atmosphere in particular if uh, if feedbacks and transport can't be represented in these sort of linear ways, it tells us that feedback temperature dependence and changes in, in equilibrium climate sensitivity are part of your your climate. So it's sort of uh, the this sort of feeds into the state dependence in a certain sense. And I hope you, you'll in a moment you can see how other sorts of weirdnesses about the way the green functions work end up telling us maybe things about how the atmosphere works. So next slide. So here are some of the decisions that we wanted to try to make about uh, how to set up uh, 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 your greens functions. So you know, these are things we need to agree upon that we then would recommend to modeling groups that wanted to submit something to a, sort of a standardized group of greens functions. The first is what uh, is the background state that you're going to be perturbing when you run these greens functions? So really the, the two main options here are some sort of recent AMIP-like uh, climatology. Uh, this is a, this is a pretty common setup. Um, as some people, I think Clara Desser, for instance, was talking about this, the another very natural choice would be the control state, the PI control state of the climate model that you're working with. Um, so this is one choice we have to make. Another choice would be how long to run a control simulation uh, with that climatology before you felt like you had a good enough sense of the fluxes associated with it to then use to construct your anomalies or in general, the, the variables that you want to then uh, try to understand the response to, you know, how long do you run the, the control state? Do we ask people to run the control state so that we can get those anomalies well? Then in like figuring out what patches there's uh, or like how the patches are set up, there's how much of a temperature perturbation you uh, you have in each patch. Um, and associated with that could be, do you do multiple perturbations, warming and cooling, uh, the size of the patch, the locations of the, these patches, the shapes of these patches, and, and how long do you run these patches to make sure that you're getting a sort of a stable response. And then do we ask people to run other SST patterns to complement or, or help with this discussion, something that I haven't, didn't put up on this slide, but it's also a, a consideration is how do you handle ice? And then a decision is what do we ask people to, uh, what do we ask people to make sure to output as part of the requirements of participating in this? And are there then tier two type uh, variables that we could also try to collect? So this is sort of just to give a general sense of the sorts of questions that we were, we wanted to try to answer um, and uh, in preparing this protocol. Next slide. So we had a, a we had sort of uh, some things to start with, which is that six groups had already run, at least had already run some Green's function setups. Um, and you saw this figure early in the week. It gives some sense of a reassuring uh, consistency and maybe what, what is going on physically of these uh, tropical convecting regions with uh, negative feedbacks. Uh, but then there was also a consistent thing that was somewhat concerning or at least surprising Next slide. So um, the second row in this figure shows uh, Jacobians constructed using patch experiments in which the temperature was cooled. And the third row shows ones in which the temperature was warmed. Uh, and then the bottom row shows the, for when we have both taking the average of the two. Uh, next slide. I should also mention that I, I wasn't able to include uh, the, uh, the cooling experiment from the GFDL uh, model, but maybe we're able to catch it on both songs poster, but it also sort of is consistent with what you see here, which is the cooling Jacobians, the, the Jacobians constructed from cooling tend to have uh, more positive feedback. So these have all been normalized for the temperature change. So they should be, if the world was, was linear in a way that we expected, these would all be the same. But instead we have a situation where Positive perturbations give you more negative Jacobians. Negative perturbations, coolings give you more positive Jacobians. Um, uh, next slide. We also did, as part of this protocol work, a sort of little mini MIP 
where we had uh, three uh, models where we ran the exact same patches over a smaller region of the Earth, just over the tropical Pacific. Um, so Jason and Andrew uh, kindly ran their models with these patches. Next slide, please. And the story ends up being the same again, that there's a quite a strong difference between cooling versus warming patches. Uh, next slide. And that specifically that difference seems to be associated with these regions of tropical convection and with these regions that have these uh, strong negative feedbacks. Um, so uh, uh, next slide, please. And so they do give things that look, you know, reasonable once you take their mean. Um, so a first thought looking at this might be, well, does this imply some sort of temperature dependence that maybe uh, there's, you know, we just need to, we just need to make sure we only look at a small enough range that we, uh, that the linear assumption would hold and there, and we can't use Green's functions beyond two degrees or something like this. And maybe two degrees was already too much. Um, next slide, please. But this doesn't really look like a classic temperature dependence. It doesn't look like something where each uh, degree of warming gives you a further and further uh, sort of consistent change in your feedback. It's more just like a asymmetry. Just any warming gives you a quite different response than any cooling. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. And then next. So um, Nader mentioned this paper in his panel discussion. I think this is probably what's happening is that there's uh, nonlinearity is associated with the threshold of convection. So this is this uh, great study from Zhang and Fuglestaller, uh, where they showed that um, the uh, moistatic energy underneath uh, uh, a convecting cloud is consistent across uh, uh, large parts of the tropics, both in observations and in climate models. Um, so. This is, this is now an avenue that we're pursuing is to try to see if this is what's happening specifically in these models, but some evidence from this can just be seen by looking at the patch response to, um, uh, looking at the patches individually. It's the next slide. So for instance, um, here are three patches from HADCM3, where we have, uh, so this is a net TOA flux from warming versus cooling, and then the difference between the two. So there's a, um, some of the response, you know, when we're looking at the response to the patch over the tropical convecting region, that has more of a far field response, but it also has a lot of a local response. The other tend to just be local, but it's, it looks like it's, uh, the difference is just that the, the minus four is much more muted. It's not that having nearly as much of an effect as the, as the warming. Uh, next slide. So this is the, this is the ascent. Um, pattern and you know, so the, again, the difference would maybe be the most important thing to look at. Just you're getting much more of an increase in convection than, uh, from warming than you're getting a decrease in convection from cooling locally. And this is consistent. Next slide, please, with what Andrew was seeing in Icon. Um, that there's a local change in the there's a local nonlinearity, a local asymmetry in the responsive ascent to warming a patch. Um, there's another unusual feature about this. So it'd be one thing if we just had this asymmetry, but uh, next slide, please. This asymmetry also depends on our patch setup in a, in a somewhat surprising way. So here I did a bunch of different possible patch setups over the tropical Pacific for HADCM3. Um, they have a varying range of resolution or of, uh, of coverage and of size. Next slide, please. Um, and what you can see is that the Pretty much the smaller or the the more uh, yeah the smaller the patches and this and the steeper the gradients associated with those patches the stronger this asymmetric effect is so you know on one on one end we have uniform and the feedbacks are not that different between cooling and warming on the other on the other end we have uh, these patches where you get a really strong difference next slide please um, it's just uh, showing that uh, next slide please. Um, this is just the average of the two. So even in the average, uh, you can see that uh, having a higher resolution, or, a, or I should say smaller patches, doesn't give you um, the same change for the cooling as it does for the warming. 
the warming patches get more negative than the cooling patches get positive, if that makes sense, that your average is a more negative feedback. Um, so I think this is actually maybe a part of the issue that we're seeing, a very consistent thing we're seeing with Green's functions is often that they overestimate the response uh, to uh, uh, when we uh, supply them with like an abrupt forcing of some sort, they tend to get a, a too negative feedback. And part of that could be other sorts of nonlinearities, but it could just be that the uh, response to uh, an abrupt uh, CO2 forcing in the long term is, is pretty uniform. And so for some reason, this particular asymmetry happens more when you have more uh, fine grained temperature patterns, more bumpy temperature patterns, that, that this, uh, this asymmetry and convection comes out more there. And so that could be part of the reason that the Green's functions are overestimating the radiative response. So this would be a different phenomenon than like a state dependence or a temperature dependence. It's just something about the, the structure of, of doing these perturbations. Next slide, please. So this is one attempt to get at this mathematically is uh, I constructed this sort of gradient metrics for these different patch setups where I just took the difference in temperature between each, uh, each point on each patch and its neighbors and then took, did the same sort of weighted average that we used to construct a Jacobian to construct sort of a map of these gradients and then took the global average uh, or the, I should say the tropical Pacific average associated with each setup. Next slide, please. And you can get this sort of relationship where you can see uh, a dependence of the feedback uh, for the warming Jacobians, for the cooling Jacobians, and for the average Jacobians on this sort of degree of, of this gradient metric. So this is, this is all to say, you know, we went into this, I think, expecting that this was going to be a pretty easy problem to figure out. And then it turns out there's a much more complicated thing going on. And I don't think this is just of interest to people trying to set up Green's functions experiments. I think this is probably something about the pattern effect. This is something, this is probably some feature that, you know, it's not, maybe it's not just enough to say, oh, you have warming in the West Pacific uh, warm pool versus elsewhere. It could be that warming patterns that have uh, perturbations that are much smaller run into this asymmetry associated with setting off convection, convection versus not. So I think this is telling us, uh, this is another way in which maybe, oh, the Green's function seems kind of wonky or, 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 or weird, but it's actually helping us potentially understand something real and physical. Um, anyway, that's, that's, the, the, that's, that's the part about how these things are, are complicated. Now I'm just gonna try to show some results that, that hopefully help us figure out what the right setup to use is. So next slide, please. Um, so, um, for the rest of the talk, I'm mostly going to be focusing on the Jacobians you can see in the right, uh, uh, in the right uh, of this figure that, that had CM3 Jacobians, and specifically I'll be using the average of the plus four, plus two, minus two, and minus four, and just, uh, if there's not a lot of difference between choosing that option versus choosing plus four or minus four or plus two minus two, just as long as you're averaging between both positive and negative perturbations. Um, so that seems to be an important thing to specify. So uh, next slide, please. So this is using that Jacobian to reconstruct historical radiative response using, uh, you know, in, in, in a fixed SST experiment. Here it's over an ensemble of such experiments. But it does, a, it does a decent job of getting the change in uh, interannual variability. Um, uh, the two numbers in the upper right-hand corner of the screen are the root mean square error and, and the R squared of the estimated, uh, the estimated response, which is the purple line, and the, and the actual response given by the fixed SST models, which is the black line. Next slide, please. This is the abrupt four times, and as is consistent with a lot of other studies, we get too strong of a of a rate of uh, we get you know too too negative of a feedback, too strong of a response. And again, I I I think this might not be a, a temperature dependence thing so much as a issue with this gradient effect. Um, and some evidence for that. Next slide, please. 
is that we can decompose the, this radiative response between uh, the part of this uh, radiation due to uniform warming and the part due to the pattern that's the anomaly once you subtract the uniform warming. So this blue is sort of the uniform warming. You can also use this to see that this, uh, that Jacobian uh, generated estimated a, a two A flux for the historical uh, more tightly fit the actual pattern. So evidence that we're getting some sort of useful information about the pattern effect in that model. Now we're down to a, a worse, uh, a worse estimate. But so this is the uniform. Uh, next slide, please. This is if you then, uh, so th that uniform thing is if you perturb your fixed SS, uh, your uh, atmosphere only model with just uh, a uniform time series that has the same global mean as the either the abrupt or the historical time series. This is the anomaly that you would get if you subtract out the global mean and you run that. If you add them together, next slide, please. You get the right response pretty both for the historical historical and for the abrupt four times. And that to me suggests that it's not an issue that uh, there's some sort of strong state dependence associated with being in a warmer world. And, and at least for the first 150 years of the abrupt four time simulation, definitely, as you saw, maybe in the, in my poster or some of the slides I showed early, earlier in the week, once you get beyond 150 years, absolutely temperature dependence and state dependence becomes important. But here we have a situation where we're looking at the response to the pattern, uh, evaluated with respect to the baseline of pre-industrial conditions. And then we're applying it in a, to, uh, we're trying to then estimate the rate of response associated with that oscillation of that pattern around a much warmer state, and it still seems to do pretty well. So it suggests in theory, we should be able to do this, at least for the first 150 years, we should be able to construct Green's functions that recreate this response. Um, but again, I think that probably, and this is, this is work that we will need to figure out how to do, probably that the secret is to figure out how to account for that asymmetry, that gradient effect. Next slide, please. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so this, one of one potential way of trying to at least lessen this issue is to first, uh, you to ask people to always run uniform experiments and use that to construct the part of the, the rate of response associated with the, the global mean warming, you know, in an abrupt simulation, and then just use the, the Green's functions to reconstruct the variations around that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, sorry, one more. Okay, I, maybe that, that's, that figure didn't make it in. It doesn't get you all the way, but it gets you much closer than the sort of overestimate that you tend to get. I think there's a slide about this later on. Um, okay, so uh, now we're just gonna go into looking at each of those those bullet points for the protocol and looking at them one by one and trying to see if we can uh, come to a conclusion about what we should do. So first is, does it really matter if we choose PI control versus observations uh, as, uh, as our uh, base climate? If it doesn't really matter between the two, maybe we could just choose uh, uh, OBS because it's a thing that's consistent between the models. So this these are Jacobians constructed for those uh, two different Base states, you can see that they look very different. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but the reconstruction that you get from using the OBS as opposed to PI control, so this is using, yeah, using the AMIP instead of PI control, it's a little bit worse, but it's not radically different. So this could be a trade off that we decide is worth it, is just to have a consistent uh, set of uh, boundary conditions. Uh, and next slide, please. So that's just a comparison. That's with um, that's with the a PI control. So there is a little bit of a loss of signal, but it's not it's not so terrible. Next slide, please. Um, how many control years do you need? You really don't need that many. I uh, I think I was overly worried about this. So something like twenty years seems like it's enough. Um, if we ask people to run that. Uh, maybe it's model specific, so maybe 20 or 30. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for how many patches, years of patches that you need, um, 
So I was using four different patches to construct each Jacobian because, uh, for, for, excuse me, I was four different experiments per sort of patch because I was taking the average over plus four minus uh, four plus two and minus two. So you could think about this as maybe we need either 10 years from each of these or 20 years from a plus four and a minus four or a plus two and a minus two. Um, they think that's all somewhat consistent. We're gonna have like a little bit of a panel discussion with other people who have been running these things, but I think Bosong said that was maybe somewhat similar to what you guys might've found with GFDL in terms of how many years you needed before things started to look good. Um, we can talk about that. Next slide, please. Um, I did some playing around with whether or not using radically different shapes or, or uh, or sort of ideas for the framework would, would affect these things. So inst if, what if instead of using a bunch of overlapping sinusoids, we just used thin rectangles that would allow us to maybe get some of the better, that would allow us to better get some of the fine grain detail? Um, or what if we just used two regions? Uh, so that's the thing on the left and thing on the right respectively. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the result, the two region didn't do terribly well. The um, for the for recreating the historical response compared to actually resolving everything, uh, the I think that the that the rectangle didn't greatly help anything compared to using the uh, more established overlapping sinusoids. So maybe because that's 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 community standard, it's good to just stick with what's familiar. Um, next slide, please. Um, there does there is some evidence that it might be better to use some to use uh, uh, patches that are that are relatively thinner. Like uh, so, so both for the historical and the abrupt four times in these two cases, the the setups that have relatively less error are uh, it's the, it's that rectangle Jacobian, and it's also the uh, Chen's Jacobians. Uh, gens patches, which tend to have thinner latitudes, uh, latitude uh, uh, widths. So that might be a, a better option to go with for specifically the size of the patch. Next slide, please. Um, some people started using equal area patches as opposed to equal lat long because this allows us to not run so many in the uh, high latitudes where you would need to, uh, you know, they, they get so small that the signal to noise gets quite bad. And so you would have to run things for a really long time. Um, I just, uh, I was just talking with Sarah Kang about the point, the importance of maybe choosing these, your Southern ocean, uh, patches wisely, or maybe going in to the other extreme and just using a, a Southern ocean zonal patch to at least ground, maybe ground things a bit more physically. Um, yeah, th these, these figures show that you get really noisy looking Jacobians. That doesn't reflect, you know, the, the, the bottom row does not reflect likely the, what the Jacobians look like in that part of the world. Instead, they probably just reflect the fact that 40 years is not enough to, you know, for the small perturbation and temperature to rise above the noise of in internal variability. Um, so something more towards equal area is better, or even if it's more, uh, something more human. Uh, readable than just using equal distances or something. Uh, next slide, please. So this sums up some of the answers that we're starting to get. Um, I didn't want to put this down too too much in stone because I just wanted to, to share. This was an effort to provide information to the community so that to inform a discussion about what this could look like. And uh, now I would like to open up this the session to a discussion in which we're going to have some people who have run Jacobians in the uh, run Green's functions in the past to come up, maybe share their thoughts on on how they think the protocol should develop. And then we would love to hear what your thoughts are, your questions are, what things you would want to get out of a project like this. Uh, maybe if you're someone considering running these, what would be helpful about, you know, about what, what, what would be useful to you in a, in a protocol proposal that we would put out. And then the goal is in the very near term to actually put out a specific proposal about how this would work. So thank you for listening. I know it's a lot of technical stuff and it's the end of a long workshop and you stuck around. So thank you for that.
Okay. All right, do we have any questions? I think um, Jonah wants to invite a few people up on the stage as well. Jonathan also, Jonathan Gregory online says, thank you for the presentation. Uh, Go ahead, Kyle. Yep. Uh, first of all, really cool and also depressing how complicated things are looking. But one, th one thing that really struck me is um, that the asymmetry between warming and cooling really showed up in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, is that telling us something about fundamental physics, that clouds tend to respond more there to cooling than to warming? And if so, is that realistic? And then secondly, the Southern Ocean stands out as differences between models. I'm wondering if that's also truly reflecting Southern Ocean cloud feedbacks or if that's some, some non-local effect that's kind of getting wrapped into the radiation. You could speak to that as well. So I had thought, I, in my memory of it, I thought that the, the largest asymmetries were actually happening in areas of, of tropical, like more like the West Pacific. So maybe that's why I was sort of hoping we could pull up the figure because I, I wanted to make sure I understood what, what which part you were looking at. The, can, is it possible to go back to one of those, any of those figures where we have multiple bands of maps of, uh, sorry about this. Also, I'm, I, I misremembered what it looked like, but I thought that, I thought the East Pacific was a place that was quite asymmetric. I uh, keep going because we, we'll get to a map with differences in it. Yeah, so sorry, one of those would have been good. Yeah, um, the third, the third row, I guess. So I, I, it seemed like it was places, the largest differences were in the places that already had large Greens functions, which were mostly a large negative Greens functions, it seemed, which were the tropical convecting regions. At least that's my, I mean, there's some, there's some in the East Pacific, but it seems not to be the, the regions where we have the, um, Okay, yeah, sorry, I misremembered that. Same question then. Is that, is that telling us something fundamental about cloud physics? There's yeah, I, well, there. can we learn from that? Yeah, I think it probably is related to that uh, convective threshold. But I don't know do if other people are, do you have any thoughts about um, Yeah, I think it's, it's probably related to that. So, yeah, I think it is related to at least to physical processes uh, and maybe related to cloud formation there. So. Like my question is kind of follow to that is that uh, if if there is a threshold physics according to Yi Zhang and Stefan uh, Stefan Pipelister's work, we will they would be wrong a couple of rounds that uh, just for the Western uh, uh, Pacific warm pool we kind of warm multiple patches at the same time will and uh, kind of put that nonlinear information in the Jacobian, uh, maybe that will improve the green functions reconstruction for the four times CO two experiment. Did, did any of the other people up here run situations where they perturbed? I think I remember people running ones where they perturbed two regions jointly. Did, did, did you guys see nonlinearities that might support that type of, might be getting some of that behavior, smoothing out some of that nonlinear, that, uh, that threshold behavior? Uh, yes. So I think in US paper, when she did like uh, two patches, like stay far away from each other, it's kind of linear. But when you two patches stay clo uh, close to each other, the linearity is, uh, you know, it may break up. And I did like that kind of simulation. And that's a case for the GFDL model. So when you have two patches stay too close to each other, since, we, you know, it's not uh, linearly add up together. Can I ask, is that unique to the uh, warm pool or it's actually uh, kind of a gen general behavior for other regions, let's say Southern Ocean or even the Cold Tank? Uh, I only did this over, I think, over the ITCZ region, mostly in the tropics, and uh, that's the case uh, for, for the GFDL model. But this is a very good question, where to put those patches? For example, we actually also did test with two adjacent patches, but only within the warm pool. So like we, if you put all the patches within this convective region, it doesn't give you nonlinearity, but probably if you, one in the warm pool, one outside of warm pool, that probably where the nonlinearity breaks up, uh, linearity breaks up. Um, this, this does make me wonder, I like the idea that maybe somehow doing more <clears throat> Jacobians that are constructed using joint patches might help us to alleviate or ameliorate this, uh, this gradient issue. I think as Andrew Williams was suggesting that maybe we try to do some you could construct Jacobians by having just a bunch of random perturbations. I, I, he was referring to some paper where they, they managed to get some green function-like response by 
randomizing the field and then doing some statistics on that to generate the Jacobian. So maybe that actually ends up being um, something that doesn't have this bias, this gradient bias. I just want to add that um, we also did two patches separately, like one in the West Pacific, one in the East Pacific, and that was still linear. And then when we put them next to each other in the West Pacific, it was nonlinear. But I mean, they were also, yeah, overlapping a lot. And I was thinking more about Kyle's comment. And um, I don't know if you remember when Jonah showed the patch perturbations, the positive and the negative, but just in the East Pacific, I think it was just because maybe the clouds are already saturated in the east pacific so there wasn't that change like when you add four you completely get rid of those clouds so i think that's where that's coming from who was next uh, i don't okay margaret um hi uh margaret duffy from ncar um as we were talking i was wondering if it would be feasible to be running these with these kind of like satellite observing simulators turned on and potentially look at uh the role of clouds um to these different patterns of warming, um, have you thought about that at all? Is that feasible? Is, is, is that something that may that's a great idea and a, and a, and, a, and would be yeah I think that, that's an excellent idea. Do you know if that's something that is specific to certain generations of 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 GC? Is it more likely to be the case for you know we have a wide diversity right now? I think of um, I mean we're going to be asking this to the community that is relatively more state of the art compared to I guess some of the models that have been participating so far. So. If this is something that's available to more to, in, pretty, in, in a standard way in the more recent CMIP models, then yeah, we can absolutely ask people to do this. So, yeah. I noticed you had a question uh, up there about uh, saving the Jacobians versus the full fields. And going back to our um, discussion earlier about how the pattern effect is uh, relevant for more than just radiative feedbacks and extending to regional circulations and precipitations, I'd really advocate for, for saving. I know there's data, um, this generates a lot of data. So some at least select fields like uh, single level circulation fields, precipitation, surface air temperature, so that um, there can be an entire uh, um, additional research questions asked from this um, type of, uh, these type of simulations about the impacts on stationary waves and regional precipitation patterns. And I think it'd be really yeah. valuable to, to save that output as well. I think we're working on where to store this data still. So, but we don't have something yet. We, we, have, we, we have possibilities. It's not, it's not like, uh, but, but yeah, that, that, that I, I agree that we, it's better if we can actually say, save more things so that we're not just looking at the rate of response, but can think more broadly about what about many pattern effects, not just one pattern effect. I quite like Rob's point. Actually, I got a comment. I forgot either online or in, breakout room, uh, we've been so focused on one point, like localized SST force into global mean radiation, but then someone asked me, can you see like this local radiation change, how much is coming from local SST versus remote SSTs? In other words, reverse the Jacobian to make the uh, almost opposite type of this pattern to show how much remote SSTs contribute to this one single point of radiation or precip change. That's something we, ha we have data, but haven't looked at, but pretty interesting. Yeah, in the original Barsugli 2002 paper, they do the inverse Jacobian, which so you just like get an SST pattern if you want to know what produces a certain, uh, and they did a precipitation Jacobian. So they wanted to know what would produce a certain precipitation pattern over the southwestern United States. And you can use the inverse of the Jacobian to get you that SST pattern. Yeah, I want to mention one thing is that since you already bring this up uh, about the different fields, so when we like provide the Jacobi metrics to the general public, I want to mention that we should consider about the resolution stuff. Since you want to use the Jacobi metrics with like observed SST patterns, you need to consider about the actual physical area of the grid point. Otherwise, it's 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 too it will mess up. I think. Hi, uh, I'm Moritz from MPI. I have two questions for my understanding. So there was this one model that in the cooling uh, Green's function had only positive feedback, and I wondered if you could comment on this. That seems seriously off to me. It's not on this slide, but I saw it on another slide. Um, yeah. And the second question is. Uh, what's the justification for using the average Green's function instead of just 
using the warming greens function when you look at a warming simulation and the cooling greens function when you look at a cooling simulation? Like what, what's, your, what's your thinking about that? So um, to, for me, the, the, my, so for the first one, to answer the first question, it only, it, 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 there are some cases where it looks almost entirely positive and it's only because of this, this uh, the fact that we're summing the response to a lot of small perturbations. So I think it would probably be the same story as in this figure you can see if you were to actually warm the entire, trop you know, if you were to actually warm the entire uh, tropical Pacific, you would get a negative feedback of like, or sorry, if you were to cool the tropical Pacific, the feedback associated with cooling by by four degrees would be, I think that says like minus 0.75. But then if you take the average of uh, the Jacobian that you construct all the way on, on the left, it's like positive. It, it suggests you have an overall positive feedback. And so you, I think what's happening in practice is if you, if you perturb that patch, you maybe you do you know, if you cool that patch, you do lose energy, which is the, the counterintuitive surreal thing, but then local processes would, would stop that from running away in some way. And whereas, you know, it, it, you do not get the same thing. I imagine this would be the same case for that model. You would not get the same thing if the entire region cooled. You would not get a net uh, loss of energy. But doesn't that seriously reduce our confidence in the method? I think it means that our method needs to get more sophisticated. Like, I, I, I don't, I think it actually, again, I think this is telling us something potentially real about how uh, the pattern effect works. So, I mean, this, and, and that, I mean, that's, I'm, it's, that's a hypothesis. We should now try to understand that. But um, uh, I think it, it, probably the world tends to look more like um, somewhere in between those two things, you know, a, a very discrete, a patch of temperature change and a, and a, and a smooth patch. And then, and then to, to, I don't know if that's, uh, yeah, to, for the second question, and maybe different people have different feelings about this. Um, for some extent, it was just practical. I noticed that it worked better. Um, but then I think the, the intuition for it was that uh, I was often trying to capture what seemed like variations around a mean, more like internal variability. And for that, it seemed like you wanted a balance between these two. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and, uh, for 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 you for getting rid of the uniform signal, the the global mean signal, I did in fact actually use uh, just sort of like just the warming uniform patches because those do perfectly recreate the uniform response that you would get if you ran a time series of uniform warming. So there, I agree with you. Physically, that should be what happens if you warm. You should use things associated with the warming, and that does seem to be the case once you get rid of this local effect, this gradient effect. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, just to follow up on that, I actually quite like, uh, I'm also wondering, like we have some, now we have some paleo work trying to use Green's function to estimate this uncertainty associated with paleo reconstruction. And that in that case, for example, LGM cooling, well, accounting for this state dependence repre uh, represented in Green's function and should potentially also exist in fully coupled models or real paleo reconstruction. Why not we just use the cooling patches or cooling patch based grain function to re reconstruct cooling path climates and warming only for the warming uh, paleo work? I, I don't know if that's a, a state dependence representing grain function is realistic or not, but. Yeah, I think there's, it's almost like there's this. This this issue of of this gradient effect is almost like a whole set. Like we also then need completely different greens functions once you get to a really different climate state. Um, but I agree with you that in theory you should be able to use the temperature perturbation in the direction of the change that you you would want to see. So, um, and that again for the unit for the more uniform the warming is the the easier that seems to be. There's a. Andrew Williams uh, had a comment online, but I see he has his hand up. So, hand up. So, Andrew, do you want to um, speak up? I say two. I had two things. One was kind of like a confusion, and the other one was um, about this like uniform warming. So, it made the uniform warming first because the slides up. But maybe to Jonah, do you think that this, the fact that the patches do worse at recreating uniform warming? Is that kind of like a not like um, to do with these cross terms? So your poster has these shows these cross terms are important for the lot the you know the feedback temperature dependence and stuff like that. But do you think it could also be 
playing a role on like even shorter time scales, just reproducing like say one Kelvin uniform warming. Um, and then I have, a, I have another thing, but maybe I can leave that for a second. That's a really good question. Um, I was thinking about this earlier this week a little bit, and I think that the answer is that they're they're pretty different. Like I think physically, what's happening is di is different. Part of what part of what's happening in those cross terms that I was showing for really large temperature changes was that you had this big change in your circulation. So if you look at the cloud fields or, or ascent fields, it just looks like a different world. Um, I think what's happening here instead is that the world is still mostly linear. It's just that there's again this weird gradient effect. Um, so it's it's more just the the perturb it's 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 more it's a safer linear bet to think about perturbations around a uniform change at first, um, and then at some point there's this transition. And I mean, this this meeting's been really interesting because I feel like we keep like walking up to the edge of state of the the linear world and. I, I really wish maybe someday there'll, there'll be like a state dependence workshop where we'll, we we can all get together and talk about the other side of all of this. Um, but I think I, I my 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 intuition right now is I think they're different uh, different things. Cool. What I was just going to say was, I, did, what do people think about? I mean, I guess maybe this is the wrong you know the wrong place to say it, but do we really think the greens functions are going to be that useful for paleo in the sense that? You know, so right now, Green's functions are useful because we have some climatological base state that we want to understand how, you know, relative, you know, in the, at least for the historical re record, maybe relatively small perturbations around that base state influence variations in TOA. But when we think about going to the LGM, it's just a radically different base state. And is it better just to just to run AMIP with just like a couple of AMIP simulations with that base state rather than doing full Green's functions or using the Green's functions? And slightly against this this idea of we need to define what the pattern effect is when we're talking about it. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point, Andrew. I feel like AMIP, yeah, it would be cheaper than running a whole new set of Green's functions, but it would be interesting to see how the sensitivity changes um, if we did run a whole new set of Green's functions. You know, with the more land coverage in the West Pacific warm pool area. Um, but yeah, it might be easier to run AMIP instead. Yeah, if I could just add or chime in a little bit here. So this is what I've done um, recently in some kind of preliminary simulations, uh, looking at the LGM patterns. Uh, I haven't done everything that I'd like to do to really test this, but what we found so far uh, by prescribing, so doing like AMIP style runs using the LGM SST patterns, but also with like the full magnitude of the temperature change. So you're getting the state dependence effect and the pattern uh, piece kind of both lumped together. You can compare the results from those AMIP runs with what you get if you just use the greens functions on the SST anomalies. And I think the point you're making is totally right, that the greens functions really don't get the absolute magnitude of the feedbacks, right? They definitely get you know way off when you interesting piece is what we've found so far, at least, is for the pattern effect, if you're subtracting the difference between, you know, if you use the Green's functions on the 4XCO2 kind of pattern and you're also using Green's functions on the LGM pattern, it seems like the state dependence kind of the differences like cancel out a little bit. And then the uh, difference between the two feedbacks from the Green's functions actually is relatively close to the difference between the feedbacks in the model simulation. So I'm not quite sure whether that's just kind of a Coincidence right now, we'll need to look into it more and do some kind of simulations that actually test, you know, an LGM pattern with a uh, kind of reduced amplitude of the temperature anomaly versus the LGM pattern with the full temperature anomaly. You can kind of compare the pattern piece if you have a reduced temperature anomaly with the Green's function. So there's more to do on that front. Uh, but I think that the Green's functions, at least so far, still seem to be maybe useful in interpreting the kind of pattern effect piece, kind of why you might get at least like the directional change of the pattern effect being positive or negative. You can get at least like get a visual representation of that when you're using the greens functions, even on the LGM data. But again, it still might be kind of like you're getting the right interpretation, but many of the reasons are wrong. So still a lot of work to be done, I think, to kind of test how much we can learn from the greens functions on the on the paleo data. Thank you. Tim, I think you're next. Yeah, going back to the, I guess, um, 
kind of asymmetry between warming and cooling, the different feedback strengths that you get. Might be interesting to look at um, changes in differences in stability or EIS between the simulations because that'll give you a sense of, you know, presumably changes in EIS are doing a lot of the work to give you changes in low clouds and therefore different radiative responses. So perhaps that could shed light on to the differing responses to warming and cooling. I don't know enough about the theory. I, I, I'm familiar with the use of, of EIS. That's a good uh, a, a good point. I, I'm familiar with the, the use of EIS more in the like the subsiding regions than in the convective the convective regions, which I think seems to be more where the I mean I guess the point is to tease it out. I, I definitely feel like we see this increase in in convection in the convecting regions and I guess it must also play maybe some role in, in limiting or, or I, I'm more familiar with it as like, oh, you know, you're capping the boundary layer in these subsiding regions and that's increasing your uh, cumulus decks, but. Right, so, so you see the big differences in the West Pacific, right? Yes. But that's like, uh, it's plotting. I always get a little confused. So it's it's a global mean. It includes a non-local effect right? for sure. No, you're, you're you're absolutely right. And so that could that could totally play a role. No, no, you're you're, you're totally right. I just, I just realized there's also this the source of the warming, the the, the convection is also non asymmetric. So I'm I that's that's yeah, that's the problem. That'll play a role too. I bet uh, convective uh, threshold. I think in UA in your 2019 paper, there's ECS plotted for like four different patches. That might be. I don't know if you've seen that figure, but yeah, maybe yeah, EIS. EIS. EIS, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't know if so probably in terms of full Jacobian metrics, we kind of need a standardized standardized list to see what variables should we have to include in the Jacobian metrics. Just to think uh, like we are having like talk about limitation of uh, reconstruct the, the feedbacks or TOA radiation imbalance. But if we look at, at other things, let's say temperature on the land, mm. uh, future warming or like precipitation will uh, that like because the, it's the same experiment, the, the SSD force experiment. If we look into those temperature or like precipitation, will they, that like open another uh, uh, like topic or like uh, the, uh, like another staying very useful just from the same experiment we have wrong. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of applications of this and, and uh, it could be like, uh, it's probably ones that we, we just, no one would have ever thought of before they were used. So, so there, there, there seems to be a bit of a theme here that there's a lot of different things you could look at in terms of understanding the, the physics of these nonlinearities from, from sub cloud MSC to inversion strengths, to um, all sorts of other things. And there, there were a couple of other comments about you know, precipitation. Um, I think this ties in to, to this notion that maybe this is more about coupled, about patterns in a coupled climate, which to me suggests we really, there, there's a lot of physics to be learned from this. I think when we started this GFMIP, I at least for me, uh, sort of this limited scope of, well, we only have two Green's functions and it'd be nice to, to have a better characterization of the uncertainty uh, of these Green's functions in the, in the models. But what we're figuring out is there's a lot of interesting nonlinear physics. So this makes me think we really should be saving a lot of output from these because there's probably a lot of physical processes that could be investigated with this approach beyond just radiative feedbacks. Um, so I don't know if, if this isn't necessarily just for you on the panel, but for everybody, like any suggestions for what outputs we should be saving and where we should be storing them would be, would be very, uh, very welcomed. Uh, and when we're going to go to some program managers and say, hey, we need a couple of terabytes or petabytes uh, of space, um, it'd be nice if we get some support saying, yeah, these things would be interesting to look at the whole range of processes beyond just global radiative feedback. That's less of a comment and again, more of a ramble. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in addition to that, I'm wondering, do people which is in my mind, do people uh, ever think about doing this kind of 
greens function in a very high resolution model, like if they can produce any tropical cyclones or some other features to see if it's pattern effect can affect some extreme weather events. So that will give us more information, I think. Andrew, did you have something to say? I don't know if I, I don't know if anyone's spoken to Ryan Abernathy about the Pangeo stuff, but that would be really, really awesome to be able to have it on like hosted in the cloud somewhere. And if you are just thinking about, you know, so take, say you take for each patch, you take the you exclude the first year or two of the of the run and you save the time average for each month or something for each of these fields. I really don't think it would end up being that much to put that on the cloud, you know. Um, at least from what little I've managed to get gathered from this like Pangeo community and stuff. But that would be, I think, yeah, I just really, I, I was nodding quite aggressively during Christie's comment. Um, I think the idea of looking at this beyond just TOA fluxes is really exciting. Um, and it also, also helps us understand the physics as well, right? So, I mean, there are some things that we can observe maybe better than TOA and or maybe just for longer and things like this. So we have series since you know a certain day, a certain like time, but maybe if we can relate this to global mean precipitation or things like this, then we have other ways of confirming or building our understanding of the greens functions. And maybe I can respond to that quickly. Yeah, there are other metrics where the greens function does very well. Chen Zhu and Steve Pochedli and I have been looking at mid-tropospheric temperatures and Greens functions can reconstruct that very well, turns out. So yeah, the, the, the number of applications is pretty large. And I think you're right. You can do a small calculation and say, if you're only saving the and the, you know monthly mean long-term averages of these Jacobians, you have about 150 patches order of magnitude. So it's about the same amount of data as 150 years of a simulation. So it's about the same amount of data as I don't know, 1% per year simulation or an abrupt quadrupling simulation. So if all you're saving are, are, are the, 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 the end result of these greens functions, and you do want to save the full three four dimensional Jacobians, it still ends up only, the risk, you want to save the response to each patch, but it still only ends up being about the same amount of data as a standard CMIP six deck simulation. And in a topic that relates to the MIP, so we learned that different setup will lead to different physics or different results, like nonlinearity, state dependence, warming versus cooling, uh, patch size area. Uh, but of course, different models will have different cloud physics parameterization. So to what extent we want different, we want to ask a different modeling group to do exactly the same setup, like do we want them to run exactly the same size of a patch, same warming magnitudes, or, or we can allow for some freedom and eventually that the intermodal comparison. Uh, I think freedom is better. But then we, so when we see different results, we don't know it's coming from different setup or model physics. I, I think when I started this, I started with from the point of view of maybe it doesn't matter so much the differences, but now everything in this, at least for me personally, makes it seem like, wow, this could all, like, this is the same model. Um, but look at the difference in the Jacobians that just came from, I mean, you could imagine that this, these were members of a intercomparison study right here in some sense, like, or if, if we only, if someone had only submitted, you know, the, the, the warm case or the, or something like, you know, it's, this is, this was a surprising to me, the amount of variation. Um, anyway, I, 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 but I, it is always like a tension between like not wanting people to uh, be too, too constrained, but I, at least for me, I think this, this really underscores more than I expected that there should probably be a common framework. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, by the way, are, are there people in this room? I, I, I know that there are some people in the past who have said they're interested in running greens functions. Are there, are there how many people here want to, want to do this or are, are, are interested in, 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 in or I'm, some people have already done it for, or, or are using it, but um, curious if there are people here or, or are people more on the end of, Wanting to use these products or just curious about the this as a as a thing. Yeah, yeah. How many people have been discouraged by the the sheer complexity of the situation? I think it depends on the protocol. So yeah. you know, you you've shown how um, it depends on the patches. 
Um, so if you were to come up with a common uh, common protocol, which one would you choose? Mm. Yeah, which one do you want to choose? <laughs> I mean, this is a discussion that we that that we we should all we should all sit down and have now that we have the background to to have this discussion. But I think um, I, I think that the last slide had like the broad recommendations of of uh, I think probably. Uh, I have my own personal small opinions, but I guess the, the, the things I feel most strongly about are asking people to do both uh, a positive and a negative perturbation. So probably just plus four and minus four, plus two and minus two are fine. Um, I think having some degree of an increase in area as you get closer to the um, to the poles is, 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 is important. I don't know if it needs to be equal area or, or it could be something more idealized. Uh, I think that the size, as long as we agree on the size, like I, I you know, I, I do think it did look like it was slightly better to have thinner latitude bounds, like in like in Chen's uh, patches. But I, I think that's less important than just that we all are using the same ones at least, so that that gradient effect isn't messing up the the connections between these. But I don't know if any of these things are making it more or less likely that you might want to run. Are there things that would affect? Is it more that this that you'd prefer for there to be a common framework at all, or is it are there specific things that? And I'd like to contribute, and um, it's easier if I have if there is a protocol sure. to follow than, That's right. rather course, than asking me to make decision. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There, there, there will Thank be. If, I think what we're going to converge on, by hook or by crook, is there will be a single protocol, and we will make this easy for people to run, and it will be a shared protocol. But there is a good. That is a question to throw back. Could you said one last quick question is, how many? How many years, how many model years would you be willing to run, right? Because we can create, we can create a tiered protocol that starts from something like 300 years to something like 3,000, right? So we'd love feedback on just how much resources different modeling centers are willing to put in to help us structure our protocol. Donna's um, presentation, it seems like at least 10 years is needed. For each patch, twenty years seems to be better. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't mean the details. I mean, sort of, if we're asking modeling centers to put up a certain number of core hours, a certain total number of model years that you can allocate to this project, we'd love feedback on sort of how much total resources you could allocate. I think we need to kind of wrap up. So, unless there's some, are there any final urgent comments that anybody wants to make? I, I, because um, you actually put um, the final patches to the Southern Ocean, and mm -hmm. you actually brought it up. But uh, because it seems like uh, over the Southern Ocean, the in terms of the radiated response, um, it seems to be pretty uniform. So, I, I think it's going to be good to have a zonal patch, um, zonally uniform patch, over, at least over the Southern Ocean. Because the sign um, is even opposite uh, mm. across models. Uh, I guess just a just a quick comment. Uh, uh, your your presentation has been really interesting for showing that these details do matter, and it would make it really hard to compare if if you allow different choices. But I think there um, it is still benefit of having some freedom of of, of choices here. In particular, you, you can answer different questions if for different patch sizes, for example. You're getting at slightly different things, and I, I think there. Um, one thing that some some might be interested in only running the tropical um, patches yeah. here, and and allowing, for example, the choice to just not run anything past thirty north south, um, would save some computing time, and um, if, for for people who might not be interested in the full high latitude ones, which. Are not the big part of the story here anyway for the greens functions often. That's definitely true. I think people can make those that that's definitely a choice people can make. And also there's no reason people can't also run additional sort of patch experiments of different sizes if they like. And I, I'm gonna say one last thing maybe before um I just want I just want to mention I think there's a GF MIP thread in the Slack, uh, like a channel. And maybe if people want to be in like if you want to have information about this in the future, when we start to release things like 
clean out a, a protocol or various things like this, maybe add your, just put your information in there or maybe start a thread. And that way we can maybe try to keep track of who wants to be involved in this. But yeah, otherwise, thank you guys for hanging out. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you to all the panelists. Yeah, we can continue this in Slack and when we do eventually come up with a protocol paper, we'll probably submit it to something like GMD, which will have an open review process. So that's another opportunity for anybody to contribute. And I think with that, this wraps up the first uh, Clivar pattern effect workshop. We'll see you again in 10 years if there's still a pattern effect by then. Anything else? Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.